2008. Uh, Chairman Commissioners, here is a basic locator map so that way you can see uh, the subject property located there in that light blue color. And you see the various planning districts around as well as city limits. Have an aerial image here of lot 93. And Commissioners, this came up during the work session. A brief description here. Uh, it is common from time to time for aerial images to have some distortion due to the elevation at which aerial images are taken. So therefore, some of the lot lines that you see in this image are slightly distorted. And as you can see, lot 94, it's going through the house. So that is uh, not an uncommon thing we do see from time to time with aerial images. Commissioners here, this is just simply what gives you, the Planning Commission, the authority to consider variances from the subdivision regulations. And we have, uh, we have here, we have a, a boundary survey, a recent boundary survey of the subject property with the existing home on the property. Here we're just simply zooming in a bit to show the features. And commissioners, I'll stop here and give kind of a brief preamble. The, this request originated from uh, Mr. Sorzano and his family wished to build a swimming pool in the backyard of their property. And this area, as you'll see on a future slide, falls within the town of Somerdale's plan, uh, permit jurisdiction for building permits. And they had their building permit denied because you'll see on the subdivision plat and subsequent drawings, there are some drainage and utility easements as well as a pipeline easement through the backyard of the property. That alerted, when, when the building officials saw that plat, uh, saw that there would be a conflict and denied the, uh, denied the permit. Here, what has done is Mr. Sorzano's uh, permit, uh, their pool contractor, they overlaid the swimming pool onto the survey so that way you have this to scale. And so you see their, exist their existing principal dwelling. Um, you'll see here marked, we'll color code this on a future slide, where that right of way occurs for a natural gas pipeline. The blue area is the drainage and utility easement for the property, and then in green is the desired swimming pool, as you see marked right there. Commissioners, we won't dwell too much on this. This is the background information you're accustomed to seeing when we present a subdivision case. I use this format just to capture the background information on this particular case. But what I want to emphasize here is the uh, the blow up here right here is an excerpt from the actual recorded right of way for the pipeline that essentially says um, that even though that right of way goes through private property, it prohibits various alterations that may affect the operation of that pipeline. In addition, we, there is the drainage and utility easement that we saw uh, earlier. And that essentially prevents any further improvements to the rear of Lot 93 unless the county drainage and utility easement is moved via replat, which is why we're here today. In addition, commissioners, what you will see is that the as-built drawings of Woodmont Phase 2 include drainage swales within that 20-foot drainage and utility easement, which would be obstructed by a swimming pool. And so here is the actual recorded plat for Woodmont Phase 2. We're zooming, he zooming in here on lot 93, zooming in here on the various site data for this. All of this, of course, was in your staff report. Also, there's some language about dedicated, the dedicated drainage and utility easements. We're going to show you, we're going to show you in a future slide what the typical drainage and utility easements are in a typical subdivision versus the uniqueness of this particular development here. We're calling out here, though, that those drainage and utility easements have not been accepted for maintenance by Baldwin County, um, and the various drainage swales outside the public right-of-way are also not maintained by Baldwin County. So, commissioners, what we have here, pretend this is a typical lot, and on your right is a typical 50-foot right-of-way, a typical principal structure with a front yard, a rear yard, a side yard on either side. County subdivision regulations require 15-foot drainage and utility easements. And we won't go too deep into this unless there's questions. Typically, in some instances, that drainage utility easement may be divided in half to 7.5 feet, as you see. In some instances, the various utility providers require that to be rounded up to 10 feet. So here is what you would see typically here on the north side, on the west side, and on the south side. On lot 93, the yellow is the right-of-way, the utility right-of-way. 
you have a 20-foot drainage utility easement placed on this property, and then you also have a drainage utility easement on the north side of the property and on the south side of the property. And for clarity, commissioners, DE labeled on there is how this engineer labeled a drainage utility easement. He used just DE to describe it. This is Mr. Sorzano's lot. This is lot 93. Again, you have a typical lot. You have your right-of-way. You have your principal dwelling. On the north, that is a 7.5-foot easement. On the south, it's 15. On the west, you have the right-of-way, which is Riviera Utilities. And then you have the 20-foot drainage utility easement. Within that 20-foot drainage utility easement is a drainage swale, and the proposed swimming pool would go in that drainage swale. Uh, commissioners will flip through this pretty quickly. We can come back to this if there are questions. What you are seeing here are the actual, these are the actual as-built drawings of this subdivision. You see I've laid out the swales and we'll go through these because, we'll go through these pretty quickly and can come back for questions. Here we're getting in the area of lot 93 as you see on the left. You see swales C, F, and E. This is a common feature in this subdivision to have swales that traverse the private property lots. We're zooming in here. What you'll see also is how far north Swale C goes. It goes all the way to Lot 103. We'll zoom in a bit more and again show the features that you've seen previously as far as the pipeline, the drainage utility easement, existing Swale C, and then that other Swale, I believe, is Swale F that we showed previously. Yes, <laughs> drainage Swale F. Zooming in a bit more Again, the features we talked about earlier. In addition, there is an unopened, unimproved right-of-way that is not included within the development that is immediately south of Lot 93. We wanted to make sure we were very clear on where that is. That was discovered during the development process and has been basically set aside from the development. Some housekeeping commissioners. First of all, one of the things that made this application confusing are some of the jurisdictional boundaries. This property was originally within the city of Foley planning jurisdiction. Here's all of the documentation we received from Foley staff verifying that they are no longer, no longer ex exercising planning jurisdiction in that area. And they actually provided us a map. I'll enlarge it here. So the green you see where Underwood Road is, County Road 24, this is where they have retracted, and so the green line is where their planning jurisdiction is now located. Um, and then we've located the subject property. The point of this exercise, commissioners, is to explain why you saw a plat signed by Foley, but why Foley is not involved in this particular application. Also, commissioners, um, uh, thank Weezy Jeffords, uh, as always, for her help in reviewing drainage and other engineering situations. And as we talked about, the drainage swells are reflected on the as-built drawings within that drainage utility easement on Lot 93. Uh, and what we'll zoom in here is that Weezy explained to us there are complaints about water ponding in the various yards within this subdivision. And, and it's believed that is due to pools and other structures blocking the flow of water, those being placed by other lots within that drainage and utility easement where there are swales. Um, so Sweezy asked us to recommend denial of the case. Other comments? Uh, Mr. Scott, Riviere Utilities verified that that is a Riviere Utilities uh, pipeline. Uh, also the town of Somerdale, Mr. McClinton with the town of Somerdale, he also pointed out that at the city level, because this falls within their permit jurisdiction, they have a 10-foot separation requirement between the swimming pool and the principal structure. And I can tell you, commissioners, that's a fairly common requirement by cities. And just zooming in on Mr. McClinton's comments. Commissioners, this was all, the next couple slides were, were explained in great detail in your staff report. We can delve into these if we need to, but essentially what you have are the criteria for a variance and then the information we were provided by the applicant as well as staff's rebuttal to that. Um, we can zoom in on each of these if there are questions. On this, the conclusion, commissioners, is basically we have a situation where altering by replatting that lot to alter or remove the, uh, the drainage swale, which is within a drainage utility easement, could cause a downstream adverse effect and cause drainage issues. And so our conclusion there is we recommend the case be denied due to nonconformity with the various criteria as outlined in the subdivision regulations. Um, commissioners, I am happy to answer any questions 
uh, on behalf of staff. Uh, Mr. Sorzano is with us here today for the public hearing, and we can go back to any of the prior slides to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. King. Anybody on the Planning Commission have a question for staff? Buford, it looks like there's a fence on the survey that's in the easement. Is that, the, is that true? And Commissioner Fuel. And if so, is it allowed? What I'll do, Commissioners, I'll go back out and then try to go back into the, to do this quickly, we'll go back into the boundary survey. Okay. And Commissioner, could you repeat that question? Looks like there's an existing fence that uh, wraps the property line that already encroaches on the, the two, or the utility easement and the drainage easement. And commissioners, that's a great question. And what I will tell you, and I'm, I, I cannot answer that question based upon this specific situation, as I have not vetted that, but that's a great question. What I can tell you from intuitive knowledge is that typically building officials, when they examine these types of situations, they'll evaluate the fence, and if they believe the pickets or the height of the picket, if it's above the ground, if they believe the fence won't cause a drainage obstruction, they'll oftentimes allow the building permit to go forward. Any other questions for staff? Thank you, Mr. King. I have Alex Sorzano signed up to speak. Sure, sure. Hello. Um, I'm new to this. I've never experienced an easement issue and all the stuff Mr. King has explained. So I just, um, I, one thing I just don't understand about this whole process is with the swells and all that. Um, there are, as you can see in a couple of the pictures, there are a couple other properties, one being right next to mine that there was a pool granted probably a couple of years ago, I think it was. Um, the lot to the, to the south of mine, lot 92, is actually more elevated than mine. So one question I don't know the answer to is in regards to the uh, water ponding in different lots, I don't know who that would affect in my case being that the, the lot south of mine is higher. There's a pool right next to my house. And so that was one question that I had, and I don't know how that gets addressed. I just recently, a neighbor, we've only been at the house a couple of months, so I don't know everybody. But they came up and basically said a lot of the ponding issues in our neighborhood regard, what's that? The property is more to the east where they share, what's that between the houses? That, like, a, like a draining pond that they both have to take care of or something. I'm sorry, I don't know retention. the terms. Like a retention, retention. pond or something. And that, that there's a lot of debris in there, and that's what's caused a lot of the issues. I don't have a written statement, and I didn't know how to actually go looking for all this. So... Um, that's pretty much it on my behalf. I understand all these explanations and that about the swells and, and the lines and, and the certain regulations. One thing I'm unclear of is what can I do with my property then? Because everything is an easement from my back door to the end of my property. So it seems at least unjust, if not whether it's legal or not as to why something like this would be built and render an entire backyard the size of mine, which I don't know the specific square footage of it, but it renders it completely useless to put a shed or a porch or, in this case, a pool. So if I could have some input on that from anybody who could help me out with that, that'd be great. And that's pretty much okay. about it. Thank you. Uh, and I'll, I'll try my best to give you some quick answers. Um, whether you were informed at the time you purchased your property or not, those have existed, those easements have existed from the time the plat was recorded. So they were always platted 
when you purchased your lot. Those didn't come about after you purchased, they were there before. So unfortunately, you've purchased a lot that just has that, that type of restriction on it. And, um, and, and it's just, it's, it was there when you purchased. So um, Buford may can address the adjacent property. Quite honestly, that was not by this planning commission. We've just recently taken over this, this role of, of handling these type situations. So um, Buford, I don't know if you want to address the pool on the adjacent property. Uh, it's my understanding it was done through another process. And, and Chairman Commissioners, you know, this is, a, this is one of those challenging and uncomfortable situations where we just have to be very blunt and very explicit. Um, jurisdictional matters occur, and this is one of those situations. Um, Mr. McClinton is the uh, building official for the town of Somerdale. He is with us here today, and Mr. Chairman, you may want to invite him to the podium in terms of the actual permit process. I will share with you my level of understanding, and Jason can certainly correct me if you invite him to the podium, that it appears that there were some swimming pools on other lots that were permitted by a previous building official. Um, when Mr. McClinton reviewed this uh, permit application, uh, he realized it's in a subdivision, download the recorded plat, and check the site before you issue a permit. And I think that is what has occurred here is I can't speak to the, I can't speak to the review process of prior building officials, but I know Mr. McClinton knows to download a subdivision plat and check it at the beginning of a building permit uh, request. Yeah. I think the reality of it is there may be some mistakes that have been made by whomever it doesn't, we're beyond that at this point, but uh, they should not have been done. That pool should not have been built there because it definitely is an easement. Those easements were created for an existing swell that had a purpose to it. It was the reason it was a, the subdivision was approved. Um, so uh, that's not gonna probably be an answer you like, but unfortunately that's, it's a reality. Um, were there any questions by planning commission of the applicant? All right, I, I do have someone signed up in opposition. I'm gonna let them speak. Richard Hoff, did you wanna speak? Nope, okay. All right, I have no one else. Anyone else that did not sign up? To... Mr. Right. Chairman, uh, could we hear from the uh, Somerdale uh, building official that's here? If you have a question for him, we certainly. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Yes, sir. My, uh, my question would be, how did we get here? How did that other pool get done uh, right next door? How did a lot be developed that basically you can't go out the back door originally? Was that through the city? Was it through the county? How did or or, or Foley? Uh, how did that come about? Can you give us just a little bit of history on all of that? Um, as Mr. King um, alluded to. I've been with the town of Somerdale for the past roughly year and a half. Um, I can't speak for how um, in a, another property or another fence or another shed or another home got permitted or built because I wasn't the authority having jurisdiction at the time. Um, but generally the, the process would be, just as Mr. Uh, King alluded to, was that you know we get an application from usually a pool company. Um, we go in, I pull the recorded plat, I can't um, enforce subdivision regulations um, or bylaws. So basically whatever's recorded with the county that the county would approve, um, or if it was in our subdivision um, jurisdiction, it would be what the town of Somerdale approved. Um, if there's any questions, I have to deny it. Um, obviously there's an appeal process, which we're in right now. Um, the, the county, it's a very weird scenario because it's our building jurisdiction because it falls in our police jurisdiction. They mirror the two. Um, the city of Foley, it was in their subdivision regulation and at the time, uh, the county and city of Foley both signed off on this. Um, it's normal for an engineer to design um, drainage. Um, there's some places that you're not allowed to build sometimes. So like I could permit a portable building there if we were off the ground, I would feel comfortable with if we had it secured to the ground, there was a way for water to flow. Um, there's 
there is a little bit of leeway to dig a hole in a drainage easement and put something that is going to displace groundwater. Um, I, I couldn't do it out of good conscience. Um, and so that's why I denied it and referred it um, to this process. But it's commonplace for developers to try to maximize the property that they have um, and to build that kind of drainage so that they can sell as many lots as possible. Um, but it, it's just an unfortunate set of events thank thank you for the ec the historic explanation yes sir any other questions thank you sir okay any other questions for staff mr king you have anything to add uh, no sir no sir uh well uh just that um sympathize with the sympathize with the property owner here but we you know the drainage the drainage you know the drainage uh swale is a is a piece of infrastructure yeah. And uh, uh, and we, as staff, we just cannot knowingly uh, allow that to be altered. And I don't know how the Planning Commission will vote. My only uh, solution I can offer to you that I'm hearing is getting an engineer to look at the possibility of redoing the drainage in some way where it might make it possible, but that's another process outside of us. You'll have to go through get an engineer to look at that drain to see if it can be redone in a way that frees up that portion of the property for you to do that. Um, and you can talk with Mr. King about that, and he'll be glad to explain it to you. All right, any other any questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion we deny the variance request. And Mr. Davis made a motion to deny. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Mr. Mullick has seconded the motion. Are there any comments before we vote? Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that request is denied. All right. We'll open a public hearing then at this time for case number CSP 22-8 Empire construction property is there any prior communication on this that anybody needs to speak to all right if not give a rundown of what happened. oh wait a minute wait a minute i got to have our staff come up and make a presentation Okay, so the subject property is located in Planning District 15. It's zone M1. The property is located on the south side of Wells Road. Um, it's currently used as a contractor office shop. The address is 8188, and the applicant and the owner is Empire Construction. The current use is M1. Um, the applicant is requesting approval to construct a 50 by 75 370 feet square foot office building for a concrete contractors business. Here's the locator map showing the subject property and the surrounding adjacent parcels. Here's the property images with the subject property, the adjoining property to the east, the adjoining property to the west, and the property across the street. the zoning requirements for the M1 zoning and the commission site plan. Uh, it triggered commission site plan approval because it was uh, adjacent to residential on the rear side. Here's the site plan showing the building highlighted. And then here's a better site plan showing the proposed building with the required parking and the 10 foot landscape buffer along the front. Here are the elevations, and this is going to be the contractor's office, the office building. The shop building has already been approved, I think, back in January. Agency comments. Um, the city of Daphne has some concerns about the um, buffers 
We do require them to have a 75 foot wooded buffer on the rear and that was approved during the last commission site plan approval. Um, on this one, they're gonna have to have a 10 foot required landscape buffer on the front. And the highway department, the site access a roadway that is not maintained by the Baldwin County uh, Highway Department and it will be permitted through the municipality. And any stormwater discharge rates um, that were analyzed with the original submittal that they had um, are in compliance with the zoning regulations and if there's any additional stormwater quality requirements, they would need to check with the city of Daphne. Again, the applicant is requesting a commission site plan approval to allow for a 50 by 75 office building for their concrete office. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> they have been trying for quite some time to get this approval. They originally started a land use um, was issued in 2017, then again in 2020 for the front office building and the storage area at the site, but it expired before receiving building permits. Then the applicant came back for the buildings in 2017 and didn't obtain a building permit for the structure prior to expiration. Then again in 2020, and um, that was for both of them in 2020, and then in 2022, this year, they got the commission site plan for the metal, the metal storage building in the back. And when they went to go get that permit, that's when they realized they didn't have the proper permits for the front office. And that's what they're trying to get tonight. I'm going the wrong way. I'm sorry. So the subject property is currently zone M1, light industrial and currently being developed with a 50 by 80 building and um, it's got a 20 by 32 lean to <coughs> and the adjoining properties on wells road to the north south and east and west are in the city of daphne the property to the south is zoned residential and the zoning site plan being requested is to allow for construction of a contractor office building to be located on the front um, staff recommends approval for this case and I'll answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bates. Anybody have any, any questions for staff? I have one. What about this uh, landscape plan and the lack of showing trees? Is that going to be on the final thing that is approved? Yes. On the final approval, they are to show us the landscape plan with um, the spacing. Um, and I have that on here too. Any landscape plan, the landscape plan does not show the required trees, shrubs, and grass. So the site plan must be submitted before staff signs on the commission site plan approval. Any other questions for staff? Okay, thank you. I have signed up uh, David Evans. Well, it's in the wrong file. Let's see. Those are all eights. Yeah, I'm looking through the file. Here we go. These two are in the wrong file. I have uh, Jerry Miller. We had had a permit for this building previously. It expired. We had two permits for two different buildings. I didn't realize when I was in here last time that I had to have for each permit this same site plan approved. It was approved, I think, in February or March um, as drawn. I think it's kind of a technicality that there was two building permits, so we had to get two zoning approvals for the same issue. Okay. Right. Anybody have any questions? Nope. Thanks, sir. All right. Unless you have any questions, I'll entertain a motion. 
Mr. Chairman, I make a motion we approve uh, with the staff's conditions. All right, Mr. Bias made a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Bill? Okay. Any comments, questions before we vote? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, at this time we'll open the public hearing for case number CSP 22-9, Wise Properties LLC property. Ms. Hart, anybody need to declare any prior communication on this item? All yours. Good afternoon. Uh, this parcel is located at 9930 Milton Jones Road in Daphne. It is occupied with a commercial building, Consolidated Fence Company is on the property. Uh, it is owned M1, light industrial, and it is in planning district 15. Here is the um, zoning map. The parcel is surrounded with M1 property and Daphne, city of Daphne is across the street. They're requesting an approval of a 1,000 square foot addition to an existing building. This is the locator and the site map showing the parcel and adjacent parcels. Um, there is industrial use around it and the Daphne Fire Department is now located across the street. This is a picture of the parcel. There is an office in the front and then a, the large warehouse is behind this. So this is actually the front part of the parcel. Here are the adjacent parcels, uh, commercial. And then there's a, a, a field across the street. And this is your uh, light industrial uses. And here's their proposed site map. The addition is going right behind the office on the Milton Jones Road side. And the parking, additional parking spaces will be placed right there. This um, was approved previously, and this is the approval they received before. There are um, 12 other required spaces are in the other side of the park of their parcel in that L shape. And uh, so the new required six parcels, parking spaces will be located on this um, Milton Jones side. And this is their building ele elevation. It's a standard uh, metal building. Uh, City of Daphne um, doesn't appear there be any conflict with the existing uses in the immediate area. Um, the highway department um, said the addition is currently gravel paved exposed dirt indicating that post construction runoff may not be impacted but any additional runoff would need to be addressed with the City of Daphne or ALDOT because they are the ones that maintain those roads, Milton Jones and 181. And Michael Smith with the ALDOT said he did not see any concerns with this on his comments. So they're here for a commission site plan approval because the non-residential project is a combined square footage of more than 5,000 square feet. They're doing 1,000 additional square feet they meet all the required setbacks. They have provided all the other documents that are required, sewer, water, everything that they needed, turnouts. This should not detract from any uh, public convenience because it's currently operated as a uh, business and it will continue that use. So it's just a summary. Um, it adjoins the, the M1 across the street 181 is the RSFE. Milton Jones Road is a private, is a single, I mean, is a, does not require any additional buffers, uh, landscape buffers. And they would, we suggest, we have recommended approval of this uh, addition. It must, they must receive a permit within 180 days and any expansion of the proposed structure will require review of the Planning Commission if they do any additional. And staff, it will be reviewed again by staff before the permit is issued. 
Um, they did not, they did get approval before, but they were not able to get their building permit in time and it expired. So, any questions? Okay, thank you, Ms. Hart. Any questions for staff? Mr. Chairman, um, as I look at the site plan and then look at the, uh, on the summary page, staff summary and comments, I'm a little bit confused when, when you come off on the, uh, site plan uh, staff comments page the property appears to go to the uh, to the west and then to the north if you look at the site plan it appears that as you go and it turns to the south is that just a printing error or is that correct no the map was rotated you can see the north area down at the bottom of the page it, the map was just rotated on this on this site plan, the Highway 181 is to the top, and Milton Jones is. Bill, see that north area right there? Yeah. So it, so it was rotated. It's, there's no error there, though. All right, never mind. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Okay. I have Henry Wise signed up to speak. Anybody, let me just put this, does anybody have a question for the applicant? You're okay, I guess. Is there anyone else that didn't sign up? I'm going to close the public hearing and entertain a motion. I'll make I'll a make motion that we approve the commission site approval for the addition to the building. Okay, Mr. Mullett's made a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Davis? Any questions? Do we need to include staff comments on that? Yes. You include staff comments? Yes. Mr. Mullick includes staff comments. All right. Any other? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Okay, at this time we're going to open the public hearing for case CSP 22-10. Fort Morgan Marina LLC property. Ms. Boykin, does anybody need to clear any prior communication on this item? It's all yours. All right. Um, this is a request for commission site plan approval. The subject property is located in Planning District 25 and is zoned B4 Major Commercial. It's located on the north side of uh, Highway 180. Its current use is a marina and it's also Tacky Jack's restaurant. Um, it consists of 4.66 acres. Um, the applicant is asking for a commission site plan approval in order to um, put a temporary food prep trailer on the subject property. Um, here you can see on the locator map, it is zone B4. Um, it is to the east is MR and to the west is zone B2. Here's pictures of the subject property and adjacent properties. Um, here is a survey that was submitted to us uh, showing all the existing buildings. Um, and the red circle is where the food prep trailer will be, um, will be set at. And then in the red rectangle is the new parking area um, that's proposed. Here's a zoomed in of the food prep trailer. It's um, almost about eight feet by 20 feet. Uh, here's some of their parking plan. Um, as stated earlier, they are asking to allow for a temporary food prep trailer. Um, they won't be serving any food out of this. It will only be workers prepping food for the restaurant. Um, and the reason it triggered the commission site plan approval is because of the total building square footage that is on the subject property um, that's used commercially. Here's um, our summary. The subject property is zone B4, um, is currently developed with a marina and restaurant. The property adjoins State Highway 180 to the, um, to the south of the subject property. Uh, the adjoining properties are MR um, and B2, 
and they were asking for a um, site plan approval for a temporary food prep trailer. Um, staff sees no issues with this request and has recommended approval um, with the following conditions that are listed on the screen. Selena, if it's a temporary food trailer, is there an expectation of when they would remove that prep trailer? Um, they did not state that on their application, but I, I would, the applicants are here and I'm sure they could okay. answer that. Selena, the, uh, mm -hmm. all that additional parking you showed certainly wasn't yes. triggered by the temporary food. No, it was not. It was from a previous application um, that they had. So they, they have more than enough parking for all their uses they have on the subject it just property. just looked odd when I saw it, so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any other questions for staff? Yeah. Quick reminder, just turn on your microphone so you can hear, be heard online. Thank you. Selena, mm -hmm. do they have to have um, the food truck secured because that's a very high, high wind area? Um, I'm, that would be a building permit question, but I'm, I'm sure they would have to have it strapped down. Um, but I, I'm not sure. I couldn't answer that. That would be something for the building department. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for staff? Thanks, Selena. Thank you. I have Mr. David Evans. I got you on the right job this time. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. And uh, we do have others here that um, from architectural to property ownership. So we can we can get you the answers that, that you need. Yeah. How, how long do you expect to have the food prep trailer on site? Right now, we anticipate uh, through the end of September 2022. Okay. And, and, and the reason that the reason that I'm telling you that is that that those are peak times and our business levels drop off after October the 1st and we can maintain everything within within the building proper right. at that time. I, I guess. And the reason I ask is, you know, calling it a temporary food prep trailer, we would have the assumption that it would be removed at some point. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it is portable. Would you feel comfortable if we included that as part of the staff conditions that it would be removed with within 180 days or, or some specified date? I don't think we would have a problem with that. I, I mean, I would, I would, I would ask that if we're going to include that, then give us a 30 day buffer going through October. Yeah, I, I looked actually before I said that 180 days is the end of November. So it'd be Perfect. After, after Thanksgiving. Perfect. We absolutely would, would agree with Which that. Which is pretty close to your 30 day yeah. request. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So if the temporary trailer worked out in your favor, would you come back next year and want to do the same thing? Well, we, we have long range plans of entertaining an expansion to the restaurant that would solve this issue. However, um, under the economic situation that, you know, to, to expand and, and build an expanded area, that may not happen immediately. So we might very well come back and request again. We would like not to. We'd like to be able to, to be self-sufficient. Okay. okay. Any other question? Okay. Thanks, sir. David Skipper, do you need to speak? Okay. I have no one else signed up. Did I miss anyone? All right. Then I'm going to close the public hearing. Ms. Boykin, you have anything else to add? I, I do not. Okay. I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, approve this uh, request with the addition of the uh, language of the commission uh, to what the staff has provided. You're including the 180 days? Yeah, the 180 days, okay. yes. All right. I'll second. Mr. Bull, you're saying the motion to approve. I'll Mr. Second. Mr. Davis to second the motion. Any questions or comments on the motion? 
Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, at this point we'll open the public hearing for case number CSP 22-11 North Alabama property leasing property. Ms. Boykin, yours also? Yes. Does anyone need to declare any prior communication on this item? Okay. All right, um, this is a request also for commission site plan approval. Uh, the subject property is located off of Burr Road Avenue, um, south of Black Divine Road in the Locksley area. It is located in Planning District 12 and is currently zoned M1 Light Industrial. Uh, the current use is industrial. It consists of about 45 acres. Um, the applicant has uh, requested site plan approval because they would like to add two warehouse additions. Um, both of these would total about 82,000 square feet. As you can see on the subject, uh, the locator map, um, this area has quite a bit of industrial zoning in it to the north um, and then to the west there is some commercial zoning and then to the east is more agriculture. Um, here's some pictures of the subject property and the adjacent property. Um, what they're requesting is allowed in the M1 district. Um, you can see they're going to add a northern addition, which is about 55,000 um, square feet. And then also to the south, they are adding an addition that it would be about 27,000 square feet. And then they um, propose new parking plan with 160 spaces. Um, here's the nor northern addition. It is 200 feet by 275. Um, Here's the elevation of the building. The southern addition would be about 150 feet by 178 feet. And here's the elevation of the building. Um, since they're adding this uh, industrial use has been there for a while, um, since they're doing additions, they have to meet the current zoning requirements. So in that northeast portion that has a red box around it, um, they need to have a 75-foot landscape buffer because it's adjacent to a residential property. And the applicant has submitted a uh, landscape buffer, as you can see on the screen. And there's, there's another landscape plan showing the height of the trees. Um, this is their drainage narrative from their engineer. Um, there weren't many comments from other agencies. Um, the highway department did state the site has four existing commercial connections to Railroad Avenue, which is county maintained. Um, the discharge does not directly enter the right of way. And most of the site um, consists of already impervious surface and the proposed building area and gravel portions appeared to be placed in these areas, um, indicating that post development runoff should not exceed pre development in the current state. And as stated earlier, they're allowed, they won't warehouse additions. Um, and of course, this commit, uh, with the large additions, this triggered the commission site plan. Um, and for summary, you know, it's zoned M1. Um, it's in the Loxley area, just east of Railroad Avenue and south of Black Divine Road. Um, currently zoned M1, and they were asking to, for two warehouse additions and a new parking area. Um, staff has recommended approval along with the conditions that are listed on the screen. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Boykin. Any questions for staff? Okay, I have uh, two signed up. Randy Arp. I'm Randy Arp. I'm the engineer for the project. If you have any questions, but you see, pretty much covered everything. The the new parking is going in the gravel area, and that's because the old parking was under the footprint of the uh, new proposed building. 
So we had to displace that parking in addition to the new parking for the extra square footage. But the uh, retention was enlarged. We put the, 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 the warehouse next to it, which is the last addition to the project. Okay, any questions for the applicant? Thank you, sir. Right. Sergio Braga, if I said that right, I hope. Uh, I think everything was explained already. Okay. Usually, the only uh, reason we have, uh, we need more space, cover space to protect the materials. That's why we added the 55,000 square feet on the north side and the 27,000 on the south side. Okay. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, that's all I have signed up. Is there anyone we missed? All right, then I'm going to close the public hearing. Ms. Boykin, you have anything else you need to add? I do not. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion we approve with staff's uh, conditions. All right, Mr. Bias has made a motion to approve. I have a second. I second it. Mr. Mullick second the motion. Any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion to approve. All right, at this time, we're going to move into our subdivision cases. We're going to open the public hearing at this time for case SC21-3, Caney Branch subdiv Subdivisions. Anyone need to declare any prior communication on this item? Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman, Commissioners, I may go a bit quickly through this one. This is a pretty standard routine subdivision out of respect for the cases that we have following. Uh, Commissioner, so Canyon Branch is a six lot regulatory subdivision recommending approval. We have a small, small, uh, small sample of your plat there on the right. Uh, here is the subdivision plat itself. We'll zoom in on the lots. We can come back to any of these to answer questions. We'll show the vicinity here. You'll notice this is in Planning District 22, but just south of US 98 is Planning District 23 have an aerial image of the site outlined in blue. You see this is right along the west side of County Road 93. And the zoning classifications in the area around subject property, this is zoned RA, Rural Agriculture. Uh, commissioners, as you're accustomed to seeing, here is your site data. Uh, what, I would what I would call to your attention is, of course, the current zoning of the property is Rural Agriculture, which requires minimum three acre lot size. They're requesting six lots. You see the size of each lot listed right there, which is well in excess of the requirement. This subdivision is not of the intensity where it's installing improvements such as new public streets and the various features you see right there. Uh, we'll show you the drainage. We'll show you the drainage report from the engineer here shortly. They are not recommending any drainage improvements, and there are jurisdictional wetlands that have been delineated and reflected on your plat. Uh, speaking of wetlands, here is an, here's an excerpt of Mr. Martin's letter explaining those. They are reflected on the plat with the required buffers. And uh, here's an enlargement of Mr. Martin's drawing. Uh, going back into the plat, commissioners, zooming here, this is one of the wetland areas that has the required buffers. And then here is another wetland area along County Road 93. And commissioners, the chairman asked me to illuminate this when we got into session. One of the questions was, is that what about access to lot one? And so we have a, a flag lot here and a bit of an irregular shaped lot here. And this is from a practical standpoint, commissioners. Uh, Though there is physical access available from Bartle Street to the north, in terms of complying with the subdivision regulations, they must have access also from County Road 93. This unusual shape does give them some clearance to give them access to County Road 93 on property on the paved road to get and work around this wetland area. And you see Mr. Lowry pulled the dimension right in here in this narrowest area is almost 27 feet wide. Uh, commissioners, as you're accustomed to seeing here is our drainage, uh, drainage report from the drainage narrative from the engineer. Thank, thanks always to Weezy Jeffers for helping us reviewing that. No new drainage improvements are required. 
and we'll just zoom in briefly on his explanation for the, no, for the lack of need of drainage improvements. And as a result, commissioners, we are requesting, requesting approval of this subdivision. There are no deficiencies. Happy to answer any questions on behalf of staff. Uh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, Buford, on that access uh, that, that, that the chairman brought up, um, so we're, we're comfortable allowing a driveway to exist within that wetland buffer? Well, Commissioner, that is a fantastic question. So let me zoom in on that area again. So the intent here is to give them clearance that will not require, that it is possible they can utilize this clearance area mm -hmm. so that way they can have access, build a driveway without interfering with the wetland at all. Now, if they need, if from a practical standpoint, if there was a need for additional width, they could certainly go through the permitting process to fill across a wetland. But by shaping this lot right here, it does give them that possibility of having paved road access without interfering with the wetland whatsoever. Well, I'm just looking how it'll come in and then turn up and follow that property line and turn back where the, you know, it shows the width as being, what is it, 26 and a half feet or 26.8 feet. Um, that would be clearly within the, 30-foot wetland setback. The, uh, um, so commissioners, the uh, one thing to there is that we're not, obviously in the wetland setback, yes, they would not be able to build any structures. Right. Would certainly not be able to build any structures or anything like that. So we kind of built this around giving them that access. Now it's possible that they will, from a practical standpoint, will probably may very well utilize Bartle Street for majority right. of their access. Right. But in terms of giving them subdivision compliance, they do have the paved road access that they need for the lot itself. And if I could interject real quickly, I do think you all have raised a great point here. And it might be worth asking you for this applicant to more clearly show that 30 foot wetland buffer um, on that hammerhead portion of the lot. I'm not sure how to quite describe that, but um, because it's true, they show the 15 foot natural portion of the buffer, but then it's not clear what if they intend that entire, I mean, if I read that right now, it looks like the entire rest of that portion is actually set aside as a wetland buffer, so they're not going to actually be able to put anything in there, which we can approve it that way, but the way I would interpret that is they can't put a driveway in that buffer because yeah. they've identified it as a wetland buffer. And maybe that's their intent and we're okay with that. And that's the reason I, I'm like yeah. Mr. Bias, that's the reason I brought it up. Either, either they can't, even though you may legally have frontage, if you can't put the driveway in the, set, in the buffer, then it needs to be restricted to be accessed only from Bartle. And Mr. Chairman, that'd be as a great it, as question. It, as it's platted right now. There's no way to access back out to the road, out to 93, and, if, and, if it's not allowed to be in the buffer. And, and Mr. Chairman, when you, if you in, invite Mr. Lowry or the applicant yeah. uh, to the podium and, um, and ask them possibly if they would have any objection to the commission conditioning that approval. Okay. The advantage here is that the size of the proposed lots is tremendous. So uh, because right. the minimum lot size requirement is three acres. So we're talking about nine and 10 acre lots. Um, they may be, you know, I can't speak for them, but they may be agreeable to, uh, as a condition of approval, shifting that to give that added clearance if they were agreeable to doing it that way. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Thank you, Mr. King. All right, at this time, I have uh, three people signed up in, uh, in favor. Randall Tillman. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Randall Tillman. I'm here with David Lowry Survey and just to answer any survey related questions you might have. Okay. Which uh, I, I suppose that one about the would we be willing to move the, the line on that lot one. Um, the only reason that's there is because we can't theoretically, or I guess not even theoretically, actually we can't get approved even though we have a quarter mile road frontage on Bartle Road. Um, so that's really just there to meet subdivision regulations. It's not going to be utilized at all, more than likely, for the driveway. Uh, we have no problem moving it, um, I, I guess, as long as the, the owner is, is willing to do so. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we necessarily want to move the line because, uh, I mean, I like the fact that it encompasses the entire wetlands in one parcel. 
Well, it sort of looks like if we carry that 30 foot wetland buffer. We'll absolutely. Back. Yeah, we'll put it back. Yeah. I, th I think our best solution here is just to make sure we uh, uh, that access is only provided off. Is it Bartle Road? There you go. Um, so if you if you look at it, um, coming south from that pin where it's got the 26.8 foot dimension, um, if you do a 30 foot wetland buffer, you're gonna pretty much encompass all of that because that thick green line is wetland all the way around. Yeah. So that we would have to move that line like that. There's no way around that if we're trying to get a, a driveway width outside of the 30 foot wetland buffer. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Is Bartle Street an open public road? It is. Just not paved. It is not paved. Correct. If you were to adjust that line, would that impact the uh, three acre uh -huh. designation for the lot number two? Um, yeah, how, it absolutely will. Uh, how would you address that? More than likely, I would move the east west running line further north uh, to cut out mm -hmm. some of the 9.5 acres on that lot up there. Well, nope, lot. Yeah, no, I, I definitely have to do it. Uh, yeah, that's right. So uh, maybe probably go further north and further east or further west on that lot too, uh, just to accommodate that. Be taken away from lot one, but there's plenty there to take away from. Okay, not to be the dead horse, can we defer that to be worked out with staff? Uh, absolutely. Um, we can handle that through the administrative change process, and my recommendation would be that any approval on your part be conditioned on them properly displaying the full wetland buffer on the plat, and then to coordinate with staff any slight adjustments that might be necessary to the interior lot line. All right. All right. Thanks, sir. Uh, David Williams. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Hey, first, once again, thank you for your service to our community. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, I would like to support this um, and just understand what they have to do for the zoning, I mean, for the uh, subdivision with that requirement. I live on Bartell Street. I would not understand why a person on lot one would not ingress, egress through Bartell Street. But okay. have fully have my support. All right. Thanks, thank sir. You. Tracy Campbell. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm in support of this uh, approval as well, including the uh, accommodations that you might work out uh, regarding the wetland. And I think it's very compatible with the uh, other properties in the area. And I am also a resident of Bartell Street. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that did not sign up that like to speak? All right, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Mr. King, you have anything to add? At Chairman and Commissioners, thank you for, for thank you for your consideration on this one. And just to just to remind the Planning Commission that, uh, that yes, uh, when going through the subdivision process, the lots created through the subdivision process must front upon a paved road, and so. From a practical standpoint, absolutely, the, the, the physical access on a daily basis may certainly come from Bartell Street. What we're doing here is making certain we have the proper paved road access in terms of approving and recording the subdivision. Okay. Let me entertain a motion. Let me try to see if I can capture Matthew's comments in here. Matthew, correct me if I misstate this. Uh, uh, recommend approval subject to... Um, an administrative review process to ensure that the wetland 30 foot wetland buffer is properly denoted on lot one and um, any minor adjustment to lot lines to ensure compliance for potential access sounds good no second to the motion second. who was that okay mr tonsmeyer second the motion any question or comments 
All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. We're going to open public hearing now for case number SC22-6, Baldwin Acres Subdivision. Does anyone need to declare any prior communication on this item? There are none. Mr. King. And Chairman, Commissioners, uh, Sean, uh, Sean Mitchell could not be with us here tonight. Uh, she is our new development review planner. She reviewed this case, prepared the slides I'm presenting on her behalf. Uh, you will definitely be able to hear her present numerous cases in July. Uh, commissioners, we have uh, Baud and Acres. This is a, a fairly routine three-lot subdivision recommended approval by staff. Uh, as you're accustomed to seeing the basic, uh, the, uh, the basic uh, lot requirements, this is requesting three lots. Uh, each of your lot sizes is shown here. We'll explain the size of lot three here momentarily. Uh, uh, this was a previous zoning case that you saw a few months ago to zone the area RSF1, where two of the lots will occur. Um, that requires a minimum of 30,000 square feet, which they exceed. And of course, the balance of the property still zoned RA well exceeds the three acre requirement. Uh, the traffic study not required, as is typical, uh, similar to what we saw in the previous case. No uh, drainage improvements are, are recommended. And the various wetlands are shown. We'll explain that here in just a moment. Uh, here's a locator map and vicinity map of the proposed subdivision. And Chairman Commissioners, one of the consequences of doing a subdivision is also you have the opportunity to replat certain features. So the net effect of this will actually erase a lot line and then put two new lots and then the remnant will be lot three of this subdivision. So that's the, that's the explanation for the call out you see right there. Uh, here a zoom in of the two smaller lots, the RSF1 lots that would be created by this subdivision. Uh, have a very nice vicinity map here showing the nearest area within city limits and a very well a very nice uh, uh, very nice zoning map as well you see the RSF one area and the bounce of the property is ours is RA and an aerial image of the site uh, Mr. Lee provided the drainage narrative on the property no drainage improvements required again thank you to Wheezy for reviewing this uh, with the highway department Commissioners, in terms of wetlands, this, the wetland delineation was performed by Wetland Sciences. And so what they did in this case is they delineated the majority of the property with road frontage on the balance of the property on the east side, the northeast side. What they elected to do here was to utilize the provision with the subdivision regulations where in lieu of a delineation, they are using the Baldwin County, the Baldwin County potential wetlands map, placing it on the plat, and then using a 50-foot using a 50-foot buffer in lieu of doing a delineation, all allowable by the subdivision regulations. That requires placing, that requires placing the note number four that you see on the map right there about future resubdivision. So that has been included as required. And as a result, we recommend approval of this case before you commissioners. Happy to answer questions based uh, from staff. Thank you, Mr. King. Any questions for staff? I have Ms. Barnett signed up to speak. She's representing the applicant. Does anybody have any questions for her? Okay. Does anyone, that's all I had signed up to speak. Did I miss anyone? All right, with that, I'm going to close the public hearing. If Mr. King doesn't have anything else, then I would entertain a motion. Uh, no, sir, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'll make a motion we approve the preliminary plan. Mr. Davis made a motion that we approve. Second. Bill seconded the motion. Any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. All right, we'll open public hearing now for case number SC22-12, Joshua Acres Subdivision. Does anyone need to declare any prior communication on this item? Ms. Booth? Good evening, Commissioners. Before you have Joshua Acres, it's a preliminary plat recommendation for 10 acre, uh, excuse me, a 10 lot subdivision. Our recommendation is shown here as to approve with conditions. <clears throat> Before you have the property data, it is not zoned. They are requesting 10 lots. There are no proposed roads as each lot will uh, front on a paved road, existing paved road. 
There was no traffic study required as this is less than 50 lots, so that was not triggered. There are no drainage improvements as per the drainage narrative that you will see later within the report. There are jurisdictional wetlands that are present on subject property, have been delineated, and are properly displayed on the preliminary plat. Before you is the layout of the proposed subdivision, your vicinity map, and the layout showing the wetlands here. This here is your aerial vicinity map. This is located in North Baldwin County in the Lottie community. <laughs> There's your aerial site mount. This is the written drainage narrative prepared by uh, J.E. Hamlin, and his recommendation is no drainage improvements. The written narrative has been reviewed and accepted by the Baldwin County Highway Department by Weezy Jeffers. Staff does approve recommendation, uh, excuse me, does recommend approval for the subject case, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Booth. Any questions for staff? I want to bring before you, um, before you make your consideration, we do have two conditions. One is that a turnout application shall be submitted to Baldwin County Highway Department for uh, the common drives and that um, the common drives and pop sizes shall be reflected on the final plat uh, prior to the county signing off and circulating for signatures. Okay. And those are only two conditions. All right. I have one signed up, Randall Tillman. Hey, I really don't have anything to add. Ms. Booth kind of covered it okay. pretty thoroughly. Uh, right. If you got any questions, though. Anybody have any questions for the applicant's representative? Okay. Thank you, sir. Did I miss anyone? All right. If not, I'm going to close the public hearing. Be sure to include in your motion uh, the conditions Mary just quoted. I motion. Move, uh, we approve this subject to the conditions outlined by the staff. All right, Bill's made a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Davis? All right, any questions on the motion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Okay, open the public hearing now for case number SPP. 22-3 Cottonwood Estates. Does anybody need to clear any prior communication on this item? All right, Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so, Mr. Chairman, we'll begin discussion of Cottonwood, uh, Cottonwood Estates. This is an 84-lot regulatory subdivision, staff recommending approval. And here is your subdivision plat. Um, the size of the plat, we, zooming in doesn't help it a whole lot, uh, commissioners, but we can come back to the plat with any questions. Uh, we have both your aerial image in it, showing you the uh, vicinity and uh, showing you the, that this is in Planning District 14 with the various features and major roadways nearby. Uh, this is in the vicinity of County Road 32, just south of County Road 32, as you see on both of your maps. Uh, we pr produced this map here, map here so you could see both the different planning, planning jurisdictions and planning districts of the various cities. Uh, what I would call your attention to, commissioners, here is that the, that is showing the former Fairhope planning jurisdiction, which has retracted, which is why you're hearing this case tonight. And we have an aerial image of the subject property there in blue, as you see there at the intersection of Champion Road and River Park Road. And our basic, uh, the, uh, the uh, basic property information, as you see here, Planning District 14 is unzoned. That hasn't been implemented, zoning's not implemented. Uh, about 38, 38 acres, as you see, 84 lots requested. Your smallest and largest lot sizes reflect there as well as your, as well as your setbacks. Uh, this is a, a major project where there are new infrastructure going in, public streets and the various features that go along with that. As you'll notice on the right-hand side, all of the wetlands have been delineated. You will see those on the plat. Uh, you'll see the other things that we would typically describe, drainage and that so forth on future slides, and the utility providers listed there on the right. 
Uh, commissioners, I want to dwell on this for just a brief moment here. And um, staff, we've, we've, we're hearing, we've heard a lot of uh, discussion from citizens and other input about infrastructure and uh, applying infrastructure on developments. And I wanted to take this opportunity on an 84 lot subdivision to, to briefly explain that process, how that works and how infrastructure is managed. And so what you see here are two examples of the utility availability letters that we receive from utility providers. Um, the first excerpt you see right here, that is from Fairhope Public Utilities. Um, I like this one here from the sewer provider where they're a bit more explicit in stating that they have the capacity and capability to serve the proposed subdivision. Um, not relevant to us here, but giving an example of what goes on behind the scenes, the aid to construction costs that the developer must bear to install improvements on behalf of the developer. And the point of all this discussion, Commissioner, is to understand that, yes, in infrastructure is considered on these types of developments, and that infrastructure, to the greatest extent, is installed by the developer, coordinated with the various providers. Getting into, getting into, wet, uh, getting into drainage, we have the drainage narrative by Mr. Landry of SE Civil, uh, reviewed by our, our colleagues at Baldwin County Highway Department. And just a reminder, uh, commissioners, this is the first level of review. There's an additional review, again, of infrastructure, a much more involved review after this process when the construction plans review occurs with our colleagues at Baldwin County Highway Department. Also, commissioners, just taking a moment here to uh, uh, advise the commission, this is not in your staff report, but I just wanted to verify again that whenever we have a development or 50 units or more, 50 lots or units or more, we provide a courtesy notification to the Baldwin County Board of Education. This is a sample of that message right there that we sent them in mid-April with a follow-up in the, in the recent weeks. And so in this particular situation, Board of Education staff did not have any comments. The traffic study is required for this development. It was triggered by the lots, number of lots exceeding 50. As you see, ASSR provided that traffic study. Uh, again, our colleagues at Highway reviewed that for us. And this is, this is uh, after evaluating the traffic, the traffic engineer is not re recommending any turn lanes on County Road 33, River Park Road, um, at the two entrances for this development. Uh, and this was, in your, this was in your staff report, commissioners, but I included this excerpt because that's about a 100-page document. So I give you, we typically give you the title, and then we give you excerpts of any conclusions they made, as you see at the bottom of that screen right there. And commissioners, we have, we have a bit of a, a dilemma on this, uh, on this particular application. So if you'll indulge me, let me unfold it, and, it, and this comes to why the, de why the recommendation is it is. Um, so the issue here is that, and you'll see on a future slide, that the developer and the engineer have shown making the various improvements necessary to water mains to provide fire protection for the development. The technical issue we're running in here is that we, what we have not been able to receive at the staff level and that the engineer is working on is preparing the actual certificates. So in other words, verifying that it meets the ISO requirement and also getting verification from the, uh, from the local fire department. Um, that is a requirement in the subdivision regulations, which is what you see on the left of your screen. We can delve into that if we need to. This is just, an this is just a sample of that drawing where they show, in this case, installing an 8-inch PVC main to get water pressure and flow. We received this letter, this is not in your packet, we received this letter yesterday, and so the, home, the potential home builder for this development is basically stating that if the ISO can't be attained, that they are proposing to sprinkle, to fire sprinkle all the homes in the development to have fire protection by that means. The tricky part here, and, and just zooming in on their statement from D.R. Horton where they're explaining the ISO requirement and also what's required by the fire chief that, they are, that currently is not available right now. So this is a bit of a tricky situation, commissioners. Now, we are recommending approval because we have the situation where the fire protection issue has been addressed, has been designed. It's a partial deficiency because there's two pieces of paper that we don't have. And so this was tricky for me to come up with a possible solution. So we're recommending approval, 
with the following conditions. Um, item one, commissioners, is a routine is a routine is a is a routine housekeeping item in terms of a revision. So what we're proposing for item two is provide written verification of the fire protection system complies with ISO as you see there, and also an updated lever from Marlowe Fish River Volunteer Fire Department indicating the pros of fire protection volumes and pressures are sufficient. What was in your packet, I was trying to come up with a scenario where how could possibly the sprinkling scenario satisfy the requirement. And Chairman, we have the difficulty obviously with, with deadlines to get a staff report written because of advertisement. After we got the staff report written, we're able to vet this more fully with the Baldwin County building official. And the tricky part here and the challenge here is that the building official does not have the authority, is statute limited in his ability. Our level of understanding is unable to enforce requiring fire sprinklers on residential homes. That puts us in a difficult position where we cannot come up with a regulatory means of substituting the sprinkling requirement for the ISO requirement. So what I'm asking the commission to consider is seeing where I have struck the language here in A and consider items one and two. So that way they have a conditional approval and it will be simply up to the, uh, the applicant to provide those two items listed in item number two right there. Commissioners, also, we have a third item, and this is not necessarily a condition. It's basically memorializing for the public record. The applicant is electing to provide, at the time of final plat application, a letter from a broadband provider certifying that marketable broadband service at a minimum speed, 25 megabits per second, is available to at least one lot in the subdivision. And that is right out of the subdivision regulations. It gives them that option to provide that at the time of final plat application. This would, if it was the pleasure of the commission to approve this case, this would memorialize that so the commission knows that will get carried out when final plat is approved. Uh, with that said, commissioners, I am happy to answer questions on, uh, on behalf of staff, Mr. Collins and Mr. Deal with SE Civil are with us here tonight. Thank you, Mr. King. Any questions for Mr. King? I have one. Back at the very beginning on the plat itself, it says sheet two, C sheet two of two, detailed for detailed geometry. Was that not included in our packet? I don't see any lot sizes. I, maybe I'm missing something here. So, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I know Mr. Deal can answer it, but I'm. Yes, sir, and, and I'm happy to answer that too, commissioners. Um, what we're seeing more and more, which is, which is perfectly fine, is that sometimes to get the details that the plats are going, are actually spilling over to two pages. And so, for the for the sake of brevity, not trying to stuff all of that into the uh, all all of that into the uh, into the staff into the staff report and in your slides. Now, we do have a site data table in the upper right hand corner of your sheet here, um, if that will help that. Um, and it has your minimum lot, seventy six hundred square feet, is the is what they're showing, and those various details. I guess what I was looking for, Mr. Deal, I'm sure can answer. I'm looking for lot width in general because I just like to know. I don't see anywhere where, where I know what width these lots are. I, I understand, Mr. Chairman. Understand. So you want me to just leave it to Mr. Deal to answer that question? Because I know he can. And, and I'll, I'll apologize for that because one of the other sheets I may have just simply neglected to put into your slides. Okay. Anybody have any other questions for staff? Yes, Mr. Chairman, just a couple of observations. Uh, and this may be the, pr the proper engineering but I noticed that these water, water lines are going to run for 3,600 feet and they're iron pipe. Is that going to create a problem 10, 20, 50 years from now? I, we won't be here, but uh, the pipe may not either, as opposed to some other material. Or is that the standard uh, activity that goes on today? Uh, Chairman, Commissioners, I'll, I'll defer that question mostly to the applicant, but Mr. Boer, I can answer in general. Um, it's, it's not uncommon to see ductile iron pipe of a proper grade for water supply, especially where that is going to be going under roadways. And in many cases, that is actually dictated by standard specifications for constructing roads. Um, so so, so our, our engineer can explain in much greater detail, but in general, it's very common to see a proper water supply ductile iron pipe used in developments. 
Uh, the only other comment that I have is I really do want to commend the developer for the uh, agreement to install uh, broadband connectivity to the uh, development. I would hope that they would consider, as they do the development, running the uh, appropriate uh, fiber optics so that all the uh, plot lots in the uh, development can uh, have access to that as an incentive for people to, uh, with children particularly, to move into that, their development. Okay, any other questions for staff? Thank you, Mr. King. David Deal. Um, we have no issue with the with the staff. Um, so, a couple things about the two pieces of paper. Um, the requirement for a letter from the fire department that serves the area, uh, to my surprise, has been in the subdivision regulations for 18 to 20 years. Um, however, previous planning commission staffs have not asked for that letter so we're now you know being asked to do that which is not a problem it's a rule um, so the issue we have is when you're dealing with a fire uh, department that's volunteer they um, we're having a hard time getting them to word the letter correctly uh, you'll see in another uh, application that follows this one we were dealing with the city of Foley fire chief um, he had no issue composing the letter that that the staff accepted. Um, I did speak with this fire chief this afternoon, um, volunteering some other wording uh, that might meet the staff's uh, requirements. Um, he's spoken with other volunteer fire chiefs and they're all trying to figure out how they can word this where they won't get themselves in trouble. They're concerned about liability. Uh, as a matter of fact, he told me there's a meeting tonight a countywide fire chief meeting at the 911 center in Robertsdale. We hope to make it if we get out of here by seven o'clock, so that we can explain this to them and help them to to uh, come up with a wording that they're comfortable with that the staff will accept. So that's the issue on that one is getting that wording correct that they're comfortable with. Um, the other one uh, with the AT&T letter, um, again, that's fairly new requirement. Um, in uh, when we initially asked for that letter, they said, "Well, we got to check with corporate. We got to check with our attorneys before we commit to this bandwidth." <clears throat> he said, "I mean, we'll have 100 megabits, you know, per house minimum. That's not a problem. But I just can't write the letter." So we did provide a letter. Uh, then Buford told us, "Well, if he can just tell us he can get 25 megabytes to the site, we can work that out before final." So they agreed to that. We did provide that letter that they can get 25 megabits to the site. So hopefully that answers the questions. Um, and also the builder has uh, committed to sprinkling the houses. And, uh, you know, in talking to Buford about who will regulate that, uh, to ensure that happens, um, he's telling me that the building official doesn't have the authority to regulate it. Um, I do know they inspect them. It's on the Bowen County Building Department checklist of things that they check. So we just have to work out who who's going to police that and make sure it gets done. I know from our standpoint as the engineers, we will ensure that they're going to do that because we're sticking our neck out committing to that as far as sprinkling. And then I would quickly try to answer your question on ductile iron pipe. You're going to see a lot more of that. Uh, City of Fairhope now requires that on all waterline extension, uh, Riviera, Gulf Shores. Uh, back in the day, uh, we always did ductile iron pipe. Um, and then there was a move over to the PVC. Now everybody's going back to ductile iron. I guess they feel it's less breaks and problems and durability or whatever. It's much more expensive, by the way but that's what you're gonna see a lot of. 
and I'll be happy to answer any other questions. David, can you give me lot sizes? I'm sorry. Yeah, there was a second sheet provided, which, as Buford said, just wasn't included. Uh, the typical lot is 60 by 130. Okay. Um, except for the lots down on Champion, they're half acre to three quarters of an acre. Right. Those lots. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Deal? Thank you, sir. <coughs> David Martin. How are you? My name is David Martin. I've lived over there for 40 years across the road. The only issue I have with the subdivision, even with the county enhancing the pipes on Champion Road, the water still goes over the road. It fills up to the ditch. And with the farmland leaving, the water will not be penetrating like it used to. So with their detention pond they're going to put in there, where is that water going to go? That's my question, because the 100 acres south of us, part of that water drains into the ditch, and it goes back under the road where the county originally elevated the road and stopped the natural flow of water. So it causes the water to back up into our land. That's my only issue I have. Okay. I'll see if we can get the applicant come back up here and answer that question for us. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for this gentleman? Okay. Mr. Deal, you want to address that? I'll try to sit quick and get back to the plan for you, too. Okay, there you go. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentleman's correct. Uh, there's some water that comes from the west um, toward the east. And then this site sheet flowed south and uh, it crosses under Champion Road and there is a lot of water that goes under there. Um, we looked at this from a number of different angles and that's why we stayed out of, completely out of that area. Um, but the water will continue to go under there and uh, at the same or less rate than it goes under there today. Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. King, you said that engineering staff has looked at the, I guess, the drainage at this point that was submitted. Yes, sir. And I, I know it'll be more detailed as it goes on from here. Yes, sir. So, and, and that's a great question, and, and to give us a chance to elaborate on that. At the preliminary plat level, we'll get a drainage narrative prepared by the engineer of record or the engineer of record working on that, where they give us an overview of flows. And Ms. Jeffers with Baldwin County Highway Department helps us review that. Um, and she'll address any issues at that level, which has been done here. There will be a much more intensive review when we get the full constru four construction set of plans, which comes after this process. So every plan, every profile, every piece of pipe uh, will be shown on, multitude, on multiple drawings that their entire staff will go through in a very painstaking fashion. So if this is satisfactory at this stage, that opens the door for the more intense review that will come after preliminary plat is approved. Yeah. So, Mr. Martin, just to answer your question, they've looked at it on a preliminary basis now, but they will have to submit detailed plans to the engineering department at the county who will review it at that time to make sure that it meets all the requirements and addresses some of those very issues you're talking about. But it's, uh, it's something they'll have to work with county staff on to make sure it's, it, it works to the county standards. And Mr. Chairman, I put that back on screen here, and you can see Mr. Landry uh, not only prepared the drainage narrative, but put his PE stamp on it as well. Okay. And then, so the actual four construction drawings will also be stamped by one of their engineers. Right. Okay. All right, did I miss anyone that needed to speak to this issue or to this agenda item? Oh. Please give us your name and address, please. 
my, my name is Shell Moore, and I am the daughter of William and Evelyn Moore, whose name on this, and you guys are amazing, and I've never done this before, so thank you, I've learned a lot. Um, we are, my mom and I are here because we received the certified letter that said on behalf of William and Evelyn Moore, and my parents sold that piece of property in March, so we were just trying to make sure that we're really not connected to that because they did sell that in March, but when it said William and H, more we were like okay is that us so we're here but we didn't know if we if this is just a process because this man says there's a y'all got a long road ahead of you god bless you but um are we are we clear that my mom and dad do not own that or does it still because in the paperwork it still says that educate me mr king you want to educate me please help us with that Absolutely, Mr. Chairman, and I and I appreciate I appreciate the comments from from our citizen here. And yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, and invariably, uh, the number of transactions occurring in Baldwin County right now are enormous, and so the distribution lists that we prepare are based upon what the tax records reflect for a piece of property. And so certainly with the number of transactions occurring and that conveyance occurring so close to the time that we receive this application, that will occur from time to time. That that record just hasn't been updated yet to reflect that conveyance. But, but ma'am, you have voiced that into the public record here for anyone watching or anyone listening that yes, that property has been conveyed to another to another property owner who's going through this development process uh, your neighbors or your, your parents yes. are not the developer okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could do that. thank you thank you thank you all right if there's no one else i'm going to close the public hearing mr king you have anything to add uh, no, sir, commissioners, other than just to thank you for allowing us to spend a little bit more time explaining this one. Um, this is that situation where the applicant has done what they're supposed to do. We just are asking, I, as a staff level, I'm asking the, the planning commission to consider this condition so that way they can get me those two pieces of paper I need. Okay. All right, so you want to be sure in your motion if you're going to make a motion to approve to include these three conditions. So I'll entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve with the conditions presented. All right, Mr. Davis made a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Bice is second the motion. Any comments, questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. All right, at this time we're going to open the public hearing for Case number SV22-8, Ashbury Townhomes, variance request. We're going to do that first, Ms. Booth. Actually, I would like to combine these two together because the presentation that's going to be before you is actually for the, the planned unit development application, and I'll explain further about the variance in the presentation. So you just want to open the public hearing on both of these items? Yes, sir, please. Okay, so we'll open the public hearing then also for case number PUD22-6. Ashbury townhomes. Okay, Miss Booth, explain. Oh, let me first. Anybody need to clear any prior communication on this item? All right. Okay, what you have before you now is um, a final site plan for an 80 lot planned unit development. These will be townhomes. They are located in the current moratorium, District 35. However, the application was received and accepted prior to the moratorium going into place. So the application and review and approval thereof does precede that development moratorium. Before you have the master plan proposed layout of the 80 lots, this is just a detailed sheet of the geometry. This is your property data. The citizens of Planning District 35 have voted to implement zoning. However, as previously stated, this uh, application was received before the moratorium went into place. This is for 80 lots. Um, they're proposing setbacks. Um, the required setbacks are 30 foot for the perimeter. They're proposing to sell these lots, so they're going to have to come back before you for preliminary plat approval. So therefore, they're going to need a variance request for the site backs that they're proposing for the planned unit development. 
They're proposing 20 foot front, five foot rear, and side setbacks of zero, except at the end units, which will have five foot side setbacks. They are going to have private streets, 1,131 linear feet. This is located on County Road 12 South. They did have a traffic study and it did recommend including a right turn lane onto Hickory Street, um, off of 12 onto Hickory Street, and that is reflected on the preliminary plat, plat. Excuse me. There are gonna be drainage improvements and they will be shown in the narrative later on. There are no wetlands that are present on the subject property. The streets will remain private and will not be maintained by Baldwin County. This is your vicinity map showing the location of subject property. This is your aerial site map. Larry Smith of SE Civil is your engineer and has provided the drainage report. The drainage narrative has been reviewed and accepted by Baldwin County Highway Department. A review of all drainage improvements drawings will be conducted during the construction plans review, which will be administered by the Baldwin County Highway Department. Shane Bergen with PE, uh, the PE of Neil Schaefer has um, provided the traffic analysis shown to your right. This has been reviewed and accepted by the Baldwin County Highway Department. The traffic impact study determined that a westbound right turn lane from 12, County Road 12 onto South Hickory Street is warranted with existing traffic volumes and is recommended. The proposed de development will consist of individual, excuse me, individual lots for sale and will be subject to preliminary plat approval once Baldwin County Planning Commission has granted final site plan approval. This request is consistent with the provisions within section 9.3.2 of the development standards for planned unit developments. Excuse me, the applicant is requesting a variance from subdivision regulations, um, case SV22-8, so that a plat may be recorded to create a lot of record for each townhome unit. The resulting lot size of lots underneath each townhome will not comply with the design standards for typical subdivision as provided in Article 5 development standards. The staff report includes two recommendations, one each for the variance request and the PUD final site plan. A condition approval will be included in the variance request recommendation as required by section 8.2. A condition approval will be included in the PUD final site plan recommendation cross-referenced in the variance request. The request is consistent with provisions of 9.3.2 of the development standards. The variance request is presented to the right to allow for reduced lot size, reduced building setbacks, and a waiver of drainage and utility easements on the plat that will be recorded for the townhomes. Staff recommends approval subject to compliance with Baldwin County subdivision regulations and the following conditions. Condition one, <coughs> excuse me, approval of the variance request, which is more fully described on the previous slide related to the reduced lot size, reduced building setbacks and waiver of drainage and utility easements is required to approve the final site plan request. Add, and condition number two is to add the following note to the final site plan. Variance request SV22-8 was approved during the June 22nd, 2022 Baldwin County Planning Commission meeting to allow for reduced lot size, reduced building setbacks, and waiver drainage and utility easements as shown on the final site plan. Staff does recommend approval for both the PUD 22-6 and the SV22-8 variance request. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, that was a lot. Thank you, Ms. Booth. Any questions for staff? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I do, I do have one question, and that has to do with if these lots are sold individually and therefore built individually, uh, it seems like, um, how much of a burden is that going to place on the county, first of all? And second of all, um, if this is a, a, a planned unit development, it doesn't seem like there are any amenities here that would uh, fall under, as I understand, that kind of a category, uh, such as a swimming pool or something uh, in there. It looks like that this could turn into a hodgepodge of various builds and various looks uh, in this, and it's a private road. Uh, how, how will that work, I guess? is what I would ask. Let me see if I can respond in, in response to if I understand your question correctly. First of all, these are individual townhomes, but they're units. They will be on, they will, the ground that's underneath each unit is what the lot is that's gonna be proposed for sale. 
So basically they'll have just a little bit of front and rear lot and that's it. The rest will be maintained by the homeowners, I mean the developers that's proposing the subdivision. Um, what was your other question? What was your other concern that I haven't addressed? The concern is that this seems like just not a planned unit development in terms of extra amenities, something that makes it more attractive to fall under that category, as I understand the category. And uh, that just seems like it's out of, out of place without some amenities, if you will, to the, the entire project. Excuse me. Um, as far as the planned unit development, that is anything that is two, young, two units or more. These are 80 units. They are not your typical subdivision. Therefore, that's why they fall under the planned unit development. And as I previously stated, although typically they don't sell the lots, they are proposing to sell the lots. So it will come back for you as a subdivision and it will meet all the subdivision requirements at that time. And Mr. Chairman, can I, can I make a supporting statement to Ms. Booth? And so Mr. Brewer asked a very interesting question and I think a, a, very, a, very, a very thoughtful question here. Um, at the county level, at the county level, some, we have to be ca very careful about our terminology sometimes. So, uh, so yes, sir, Mr. Brewer, and yes, sir, commissioners. Uh, the term plan unit development is typically in industry more of a function of zoning where an applicant requests a certain type of development with certain features. Um, at the county level, we have this scenario where the term planned unit development has been in the subdivision regulation since 1988. Um, and conversely, we also have the term planned residential development in the zoning ordinance. So it is a terminology type of situation. What we have here is an unzoned development. And so the same level of requirements and level of intensity that you would see in a zoning PUD, perhaps handled at the city level, that same standard doesn't apply here to an unzoned PUD at the county level because our PUD at the county level is contemplating these types of developments where you have three or more units on a single piece of property. So we use the term PUD not only for apartment complexes and townhomes, but also for RV parks, for mobile home parks, et cetera. So that's a great question, but our PUD is not quite the intensity of what you'd see at the city level where that's a function of zoning. Any other questions for staff? Okay. I have Mr. David Deal signed up to speak. <clears throat> Just real quick, the... Uh, this is an unzoned piece of property, or at least it was before the vote. Um, we initially started out that this was going to be uh, rental townhomes. And somewhere in the process, uh, they decided to improve the development if they sold the land under each unit. <clears throat> to answer your question, these will be uniform buildings, architecturally uniform. They'll be built. Uh, each building unit, uh, like the sixplex or fourplex, will be built at one time. So the reason for the lot is just to be able to sell the land underneath it. And the idea is that the remaining property around there will all be owned and maintained by the HOA. Um, I lived in something like this for almost two years after I sold my house. It's really nice. You just go home, yards cut, bushes are trimmed. Um, you know, you can walk on the trails, enjoy the open space. I would point out that in the um, upper left there, it's the northwest corner, there's quite a few large oak trees that are there. Um, it's really the only feature trees on the site. So that's the reason why we kind of curved the road around there. Um, keep those trees as part of the open space, but also it provides a nice natural buffer between us and the only resident there. You notice on the west side of us is uh, RV and boat storage and an RV park. So we weren't as concerned about that, at least from their standpoint. Um, so the reason that we're asking for the PUD, PRD, 
um, is because the lot sizes will be smaller than what is normally required or allowed in the sub regs. We just want to sell the land underneath the building. Everything else is common. Um, there will be trails to walk around and uh, we're providing three parking spaces per unit. There'll be two spaces in the driveway and then a garage space. And that's about it, a mail kiosk in the back. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Will the private road fall under the HOA as well? Yes, it will. Okay. And this builder's accustomed to that. Also, I would add that the, uh, if you'll notice in the letter from the Foley Fire Chief that these buildings will be sprinkled as well. You have questions for Mr. Deal? Okay. Thank you, sir. I do have something to add. Go ahead. Um, conditions of approval. Um, condition number one, final site plan approval is contingent on approval of the variance request. Number two, add the following note to the final site plan that the variance was approved during this meeting. Number three, um, final site plan approval is effective for a period of two years, at which time the applicant or developer shall submit a preliminary plan application. Number four, the developer shall have 30 calendar days from the date of expiration to file for a one-year extension. If no extension is requested, then the final site plan that is approved tonight is automatically revoked. Number five, <coughs> excuse me, a maximum of two one-year extensions may be granted. Number six, if an extension is granted, the proposed development must conform to the subdivision regulations in place at the time which the extension is granted. Staff does recommend approval of the PUD 22-6 and SV 22-8. Okay. We're going to vote on each of these separately. Anybody have any questions of staff before we entertain a motion? Mayor, I forgot to ask, was there any, any discussion or coordination with the city of Foley on this? Did they provide any comment? This, this is outside of their review authority, so they will not have any comments. Okay. Let me just make sure, does anybody else wish to speak on this item? Okay, then I'm gonna close the public hearing. We get that sometimes. All right, any other questions? All right. Yeah, everybody had a handout here, so uh, I don't know if you've had time to read that. I have not, so I'll give y'all. Anybody need to speak to this? A quick scan of this looks like both of these have been addressed through um, what they've already uh, it's been submitted. Traffic's been um, dealt with by uh, the developer and so also drainage. So, And that'll be further reviewed during construction plans. So if there's any additional improvements, those can be recommended and accepted at that time. Yeah. And I know this was already highlighted, but just let me reiterate that there was a zoning vote in this area and there is now a moratorium in place, but this application was in the door prior to that. So in the future, a development like this will have a much more rigorous path to go through to, to evaluate that um, compatibility question. Okay. Do we need to take action on the variance first? Yes, sir. This is new territory for me. I'm, I've already yes, expressed the, my concerns the, about it. That's out of character, but I, I'll, I'll go with the staff on this. Yeah, the so variance would need to be approved, approved first before okay. we can approve the final site plan. All right. So I'll entertain a motion on the variance, which is which is the 22-8. Uh, I'll make a motion we approve the variance. Um, with the conditions set forth by staff. Mr. Davis made a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second. Mr. Tonsmeyer second the motion. Any comments or questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right, I said one no. Motion's approved. 
All right. Now we'll take action on, um, entertain a motion on PUD 22-6. I'll make a motion we approve PUD 22-6 with the conditions set forth by staff. Okay. Mr. Davis made a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second. Mr. Thomas Myers made a second. All right. Any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. All right. Motion's approved. Okay. That ends our case studies at this time. We will uh, move into our consideration for our new planning districts. Mr. Chairman, I don't know if, if the Planning Commission wants to entertain a quick five-minute break or if you all feel good plowing ahead at this point. Anybody need to take a break? We're good. All right. <clears throat> all right. Uh, thank you, uh, Planning Commissioners. And I do want to take a quick moment and just give a shout-out to the staff, uh, the team members here at the Planning and Zoning Department. Um, you know, I sit here and I watch these presentations. I just feel like they, they will tell you that I am so picky when it comes to PowerPoints and just trying to get them to look modern and graphically pleasant so that you can see what's going on. And they've really gone above and beyond. These are now really viewable on mobile devices and things of that nature. And so they've been over backward to that to do that. And I just want to give a shout out to the team. I also want to give a shout out to the team because uh, you see these uh, reports here. But this uh, zoning and subdivisions are just two of the six rule books we govern. And then we have a numerous, numerous administrative approvals that don't come before this body. And uh, a number of folks in this room are working on those constantly. We have record numbers coming in through the door. And so just can't thank them enough for doing that and all the work that goes into uh, the various meetings that we have. So at this, we have TA 22002. Um, this is a text amendment for the new Planning District 8 and Planning District 37. Um, I want to thank uh, DJ Hart um, and Selena Boykin for their hard work at this. We also have a couple of our advisory committee members here, I think just with District 37. Raise your hand if you're an advisory committee member with District 37. Okay, we have three, and I think there was one who left. We appreciate them coming out. Any from District 8? I don't think we have any of our District 8 advisory committee members. Uh, again, this is an, a proposed amendment for our zoning ordinance. This is one of six rule books uh, that we govern and that you all hear uh, cases from. A uh, quick little over overview. We're going to go through the process timeline. Then we're going to look at the proposed local provisions and maps. We're going to talk about some additional recommendations that came from that. And then we're going to provide our staff recommendation. So a quick uh, process timeline. A reminder that this is a citizen-driven process. Uh, in Baldwin County, a large portion of the county is unzoned, and as a result, uh, that zoning, before zoning can come into place, the citizens have to request it. And once they request it, it's like something going down a current. The statute sets all these timelines, and we have two new requests that have come in, one that's going to be heard next Tuesday by the county commission and another one that I just talked to the citizen today. So this process is uh, uh, really moving quickly right now. Um, the referendum process is governed by Alabama Code as well as the advisory committee process. So quick timeline, uh, we got these requests. District 8 was on August 20, in 2021 and District 37 was November 2021. From that point on, the timeline has uh, matched perfectly. Um, so we accepted position, petitions uh, on December 7th with all those signatures. February 15th was that vote. District 8 was a little bit closer, but they voted in favor. District 37 voted overwhelmingly, a, a very landslide vote in favor of bringing zoning in. Then uh, March 15th, advisory committees were appointed, um, and then we had our first advisory committee on April 7th. Um, they worked very hard. There was tons of discussion, tons of debate, uh, lots of consideration back and forth. Um, these were eight public meetings that were held that were open to the public. Some of them were, had a lot of participation from the public, um, consultants, um, agents of various property owners, and that brought us to our final meeting on May 26, where both advisory committees unanimously recommended approval of the map uh, and those ordinances. So now we're at June 2nd, where you all will give a recommendation as to whether or not to recommend the zoning ordinance and maps for approval. 
and then from there it will go to the county commission who will make uh, who will give the final approval of the zoning ordinance uh, and maps uh, just as a reminder there's a 180 day moratorium that's been in effect during this time and it will terminate either uh, after that 180 days, August 15th, or when that zoning ordinance is adopted. So now let's look at the local provisions that have been pro provo proposed. Uh, one great thing, we held these meetings back to back on Thursday mornings, and so the advisory committees, they're, since they're from the same area, they had a lot of similarities in terms of what their priorities uh, were. So most of these are the exact same, and so I'm consolidating those under joint recommendations. So um, First Amendment was a requirement for a 40-foot landscape buffer between major residential subdivisions and farmland and a 10 to 20-foot landscape buffer between major residential subdivisions and less intense zonings slash uses. Um, could go into lots of detail, but this came in a lot of ways from a lot of the public feedback we're getting in the comprehensive plan process of wanting to preserve the rural character um, of Baldwin County. Um, so the, how is this different from the full ordinance? The full ordinance does not include a landscape buffer requirement between rural agricultural zonings and subdivision developments in uh, higher intensity residential zonings. One thing that staff is asking tonight is that we add a definition for farming use that would trigger uh, this, um, this requirement. And a plot of land used for agricultural purposes including farming, dairying, pasturing, and you can read the whole thing there. Um, that would uh, trigger that for the farming use. <coughs> Another uh, proposed amendment here was increases the aesthetic road frontage landscape buffer requirement for a major project that abuts a major road. Uh, how is this different from the full ordinance? The full ordinance requires only a 10 foot buffer. This would be a 15 foot buffer. The full ordinance does not require native plants. This would require that. The full ordinance requires only trees, shrubs, and grass, while the, um, this new local ordinance would um, specifically require overstory trees as part of that buffer. Another proposed amendment here requires a full visual barrier road frontage landscape buffer uh, for certain intense major projects that abut a major road. And you can see those listed there, mini warehouse, recreational vehicle park, manufactured home park, hotel and motel, and then uh, certain like more uh, utility and industrial uses, and then also a subdivision that meets the requirements uh, of a major project. How is this different? Just in the same ways we just described, except for our current ordinance does require an aesthetic buffer for these uses. This would require and tend to require a full visual buffer like you would find on the adjoining properties with different zonings. And the purpose here is that when you're driving down the road, you preserve that rural feel um, and not necessarily saying the development can't come in, but if it comes in, it doesn't change the rural feel of these rural areas. Um, next, um, next proposed amendment requires the construction of a sidewalk for major projects that abut a major road. Um, a lot of back and forth and debate on this. Um, this is what both groups uh, settled with, that this would require a sidewalk to be built um, whenever one of these uh, fronted a major road. Currently, our full ordinance does not require a uh, contain a sidewalk requirement for major projects. So again, this would just be for these two local districts. Next proposed amendment requires wetlands in major subdivisions to be set aside in common areas. Uh, we already have pretty strict standards for this, but the full ordinance does not explicitly require wetlands to be placed in common areas. So this change would help ensure that wetlands don't get placed in residential lots and then slowly cultivated uh, into uplands. A couple notes from staff here that we're going to ask you all to kind of clarify in your motion. Uh, the area in green we're proposing to strike um, because it actually is really just redundant from what we already require. And then also recommend adding the following language, the requirements of this provision shall not apply to man-made wetlands constructed in uplands. Uh, this is intended uh, at, from the advisory committee to apply to both jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional wetlands. Another proposed amendment here allows animal husbandry on residential properties. Currently, the full ordinance is interpreted by staff to disallow animal husbandry in most single family residential districts. So uh, this would remove that requirement. Again, really highlighting the more rural aspects of much of these districts. Um, allows a Next amendment allows a professionally prepared parking study to reduce the parking space requirements for a proposed development. Um, the full ordinance has, requires pretty strict requirements 
um, based on square footage and similar measures. And you can get a variance to deviate from that. But the aim here is instead of maybe requiring this huge parking lot when you might have some shared uses, some that might be opened at different times, to allow a parking study to allow a less um, impervious area uh, dedicated to parking. Uh, next one is to reduce the allowable density of manufactured home parks to four units per acre. That's from six units per acre. And also <coughs> limit the auto convenience market or gas station use to major commercial B4 districts. Um, currently those are allowed in B3 and I highlighted that you can have six units per acre in a uh, manufactured home park. Uh, next proposal, joint recommendation, is pr proposed provision that would make all rezonings conditional on obtaining a building permit, recording a final plat, et cetera, within three years. Failure to meet the condition would result in the rezoning not taking effect. Um, I'm not going to go into details on this, but it's intended to discourage what's called speculative zoning that then never gets developed. Um, we've had a lot of legal review of this over the past week. And we think there's a lot of good potential here, but there is a lot of case law on this issue. And so our wording needs to change, and it needs to change in a way that we can actually carry it out by staff uh, in a practical way. So um, based on further discussions with legal counsel, we're going <coughs> to ask that this be striked and um, or stricken, and then that we'll come back at some point for a full amendment to the ordinance. Um, Next proposal, joint proposals, disallow traditional steel panel siding as the front facade uh, of, a com of um, commercial buildings. A little typo there. Um, this is different from the full ordinance because under the full ordinance, facade restrictions apply only to many warehouse developments. And I should have backed up and reminded everybody that in this process, um, every Every district has its own zoning ordinance, technically, but the way it works is you adopt the full ordinance and then you amend it with all these local provisions that customize it to their area. So these are those customizations. All right, the, one of the biggest changes is a new district called a Community Preservation District, and it's designed to preserve the historic rule and suburban communities by creating a stronger grandfather status for existing uses while still triggering normal rezoning and development requirements of the ordinance when a major change is proposed. Um, so how is this different from the full ordinance? Currently the full ordinance does not include this language at all. The important thing to understand here is that what this is essentially is a three-page light zoning for rural areas. It doesn't increase the requirements on developers at all, um, but it reduces the requirements for your average Joe, mom, pa citizen who aren't changing anything. So if they're going to put a, a little shed in their backyard, things like that, it reduces those requirements. I'm going to explain that kind of as an illustration, almost like a flow chart. So you own undeveloped property in the community preservation district and you want to either build a single family home or build a barn. Well, in that case, you would apply for a building permit. You would skip our department and ensure you meet some very basic setback and dwelling limit requirements and just get your building permit and you're good to go. So it saves them that fee and that extra process of going through our department. Now let's say you have undeveloped property in community preservation district and you do want to develop it for say a gas station or develop a residential subdivision. Well then when uh, that takes place, uh, we would look to see if this triggers uh, a major change essentially. And so a major change can be triggered if it's one of the um, factors under 18.9.2 for a commission site plan approval, or again, if it's a division of land under the subdivision regulations except an exempt division. You all are familiar with these factors, A through F, it, what, it's what brings these commission site plans to you, but any of those would trigger them to, to have to depart from this community preservation district or go through that full process. So if the answer was no, it wasn't a change that triggered one of those, then it would flow right to, again where they could get a building permit. But if the answer was yes, they would need to apply for a rezoning under the provisions of Article 19. And then if approved, the full zoning ordinance applies to the newly rezoned parcel. All right, so I'm going to actually pause there. Any questions about that, the Community Preservation District? While it's uh, fresh on the screen, if not, we can certainly come back to it later. Okay, next thing is recommendations that were exclusive to District 8. 
And we just have one. So this clarifies, this proposed amendment to District 8 clarifies that food and beverage service accessory uses are permitted accessory uses within an outdoor recreation or OR district. Um, how does this differ from the full ordinance? The accessory structure language for OR districts in the full ordinance is broad, but this added language clarifies that there is sufficient breadth to include accessory uses for food and beverage service. Um, another District 8 recommendation this encourages the clustering of high intensity commercial and residential developments at major activity nodes by limiting where those rezonings can be requested within the district. This came through the advisory committee, of course, but also as a result of consultations with our long range plan consultant um, and the public feedback we've gotten through that process. And essentially highlighting the importance of instead of encouraging high density sprawl, we're not against density, but making sure that density is occurring at high activity nodes. And zoning ordinances are meant to evolve over time, so we don't expect that this will remain the case forever into the future. But over time, we'd expect that these may get amended and, and increase over time, uh, but it encourages that density to take place at these activity nodes um, and be less of a burden on infrastructure among other factors. So this is co codified in a table in the local ordinances, but I'm going to show you maps that explain it illustratively. And, and how is this different from the full ordinance? In the full ordinance, unless modified by local provisions, certain rezonings can be requested anywhere in the district and the request will be reviewed exclusively under the normal rezoning factors under 19.6. So uh, for District 8, which is what you see on the screen right now, those blue circles are the major activity nodes that they identified. The yellow circles are where they allow RSF3 to R RTF6 designations. The orange set circles are the only places that RMF6 and HDR are permitted. The red circles are where B3 would be permitted. The purple circles are where B4 is permitted. To be, and again, to be requested. They still need to go through the full rezoning process, but these are the only places you can request those zonings. Here is the final map for District 8. Again, the circles are on there for illustration purposes. The actual approved map will not display those circles. Matthew, real quick question on that map. Yes, sir. Are these two an approximate scale relatively? And I know they're not. not the, You're I talking about... Sure You talking about the circles? Yes. So on this map, they should be pretty much exact. Okay. Uh, yeah. They were drawn right on in GIS. The okay. ones in the earlier ones, I just did on PowerPoint. Uh, so they, were, but these are put on here to provide that. But at the end of the day, if we did make a mistake in how we drew it on here, it's the table that will govern. In the right. I just want to make sure we were looking at kind of an order of magnitude between that 0.1 and 0.25 mile distance or radius. All right. Um, recommendations exclusive to District 37. They had a couple of their own. Um, District 37 wanted to require the use of native plants in all required landscape buffers. That differs from the full ordinance. We don't currently restrict what type of plants they can use as long as they meet those kind of geometric specifications. Um, District 37 also wanted to increase the wetland buffer requirements in District 37 and create a 100-foot stream buffer for major projects along Fish River. So this differs from the full ordinance in several ways. The full ordinance requires only a 30-foot wetland buffer, while District 37 will require a 50-foot buffer. The full ordinance does not apply the buffer to non-jurisdictional wetlands. Uh, this would. The full ordinance requires a 30-foot stream buffer on Fish River uh, instead of the 100-foot buffer that will now be required if this were to get approved. And again, that only applies to major projects. Something that's not a major project would go to the 50-foot buffer that they're proposing. And again, we're adding this recommended language to, to show that it's not, we're not talking about man-made wetlands constructed in uplands. Uh, District 37 did a very similar thing with the activity nodes, trying to cluster um, high density in those activity nodes, again, supported by um, our comprehensive plan process and the feedback that we're getting on that. We'll look at those now. So the major activity nodes here are in blue. RSF3, RSF4, RTF4, RSF6, and RTF6 
six are limited to these, um, I say orange on here, but I meant to say yellow circles. RMF6 is limited to the orange circles, and HDR is not permitted within District 37. Uh, now, this is not uncommon for us in our zoning ordinance. Uh, many other districts also prohibit, uh, I say many, a number of other districts also prohibit HDR, including districts in this area, District 26 and District 19. Um, B3 would be limited to the red circles. B4 would be limited to the purple circles. Again, this is the final map, and the circles are intended to be just representative uh, only of what's actually on the, um, those tables. All right, so final additional recommendations that came out of the motions. So the first one, uh, District 8 recommended approving the final map, but to allow clustered lots on noted parcels and also approved an alternate final map in case during the full legal vetting there was some issue with this community preservation district. We feel pretty good about it. We've spent a lot of time talking to legal about it, but it is new. And so kind of the Boy Scout be prepared just in case we wanted to have that alternate map uh, prepared as well. Um, so to clarify for the special set setbacks that were requested for certain parcels, there were four parcels that were owned, five parcels that were already owned by a developer. <laughs> Um, in an unzone, in, un, in what, what had been unzoned District 8, and they requested RSF 4 uh, for those parcels, and it's surrounded by residential development, including uh, pretty high intense development to the south. But we felt that RSF 4 was not appropriate, that a better transition would be some RSF 3 and then some RSF 2, because that was a better transition to the parcels to the north. That developer said, that's okay, we're willing to agree to those densities, but would you all let us cluster some of those so it doesn't allow us to put more homes than that RSF3 and RSF2 allows, but cluster them a little bit to allow us to do more with the open space and the common areas there. Um, and so the, district, the advisory committee um, thought that that was great. So their motion and y'all's would be to um, recommend or basically echo this would be for those lots that are stated, those parameters that are stated, and then limiting it to those densities that are stated for RSF2 and RSF3 uh, for those lots. Essentially, you're approving a PRD coming in uh, with zoning here. Approve District 8 local provisions as incorporated. Um, and then, uh, I'm not going to go into, uh, well, there were a couple developments that had conditions on them that were apartment complexes that had come in, in advance. They'd have been approved in advance, but they have these kind of big conditions on them. Um, and they wanted to say, listen, just in case they can't meet their conditions and get this done, we don't want that to remain RMF6, even though these are approved pending developments, essentially. And so they said, um, we want that re automatic <laughs> reverting zoning to occur. Well, we're pulling that language, so we're going to propose some alternate language for those specific projects uh, in our recommendation. Uh, District 37, their recommendations were very straightforward, approved the, the final map and the alternate map, local provisions, but they also had this uh, language which we appreciate very much um, because this is something we hear a lot about. So I'm just going to read it and it's something we'll read to the county commission and we've been talking with the highway department about, but not an easy solution. Believing that the county commission and municipality should not bear the cost of stream restoration within our county, the District 37 Advisory Committee would like to recommend that consideration be given to limit post-development runoff volumes to be less than or equal to pre-development runoff volumes or similar measures to preserve our natural stream resources. There's a, that is a huge issue with a lots of moving parts. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that for right now, but I, I think our, um, a, the District 37 folks would appreciate you all uh, essentially agreeing to pass that message up to the Planning Commission uh, for further uh, consideration. But it won't result in any text change to the zoning ordinance at this time. All right, so staff's recommendation. And I do want to just note that this recommendation and this work um, is based on staff experience, it's based on consultation with the county's long-range plan consultant, it's based on consultation with our environmental committee, 
It's based on the hard work of the advisory committees who, and those members who know their area very well and have uh, varying backgrounds and expertise uh, as required by statute. And staff believes that these local provisions and zoning maps proposed establish zoning for the new district that bears a reasonable relationship to the promotion of the health, safety, morals, or general welfare of the community. And there was a great deal of debate and discussion prior to arriving at this recommendation. So these recommendations are recommend approval of the District 8 recommendations with the following modifications, adding the farming use definition, removing the local provision for speculative rezonings, the three parcels mentioned, these are those that I was talking about. They shall be RMF 6 if after three years a building permit is not obtained, the county commission may, after providing notice and due process required under Article 19 of the Zoning Ordinance, take necessary action to institute RA or RSFE zoning districts on the said parcels. So it says allowing us to take um, action to revert those uh, if necessary. And then add the following language in sections uh, with requirements related to non-jurisdictional wetlands. Um, then for District 37, the same, but adding the farming use definition, uh, removing the sp speculative rezoning, and then adding the stuff regarding the wetland buffers um, and that extra language. And that is our staff recommendation. Okay. Let's begin first with uh, questions for Matthew. Anyone have any questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Matthew, on the uh, the issue of the development uh, of the four parcels, what would be the net effect of the developer if if to the developer if we denied that particular recommendation? Are you talking? You're talking about the one in District Eight uh, with the yes. blue and the green? Yes. There, there's so much construction going on by this developer in that area well you um, can't really deny it what you can do is propose an alternate zoning category for it okay. um okay. that's that's all that could take place in this situation okay thank you okay any other questions matthew do we have a do we have a definition in the ordinance of a visual barrier visual buffer so we, we don't accept that that language comes from the requirement for um, buffers on parcels that adjoin and have differing uses or zoning designations. And that complete barrier is meant, it, it, it requires a, a barrier that's essentially creates, a, it says a visual barrier, and it also includes sound and noise and things yeah. like that, whereas we're limiting this to, to visual. Well, and I guess I was thinking too, because you know, uh, when you, when you plan a landscape buffer, or, or, okay, I, I guess in theory, if you had to plan a landscape buffer that was a visual barrier here, you're planting very immature young trees that don't necessarily provide that visual buffer, but might, but might, you know, several years down the road. So, um, I mean, I think the intent here is for it to remain a natural buffer. I just, I just thought like there's a little bit of a gray area in there still. That, that's a great point. Uh, we could, so our, our landscape buffer requirements provide minimum heights and okay. things like that for those plantings. That, that's, that's probably what suffice but we, for what I'm thinking. We could add language that makes it clear that on maturing, it's going to be a full visual barrier. And, and quite frankly, that's what will be most important because what happens with these mini warehouse units, they're investments, and we're not against investments, but they, a lot of times they look great for the first five years, and then they start looking poor after that, and they get flipped to different owners who do different things and have different investment strategies and it's usually it's not making them look nice again so by that time that barrier should be well established yeah. and it won't impact the entire community on the uh the wetland provision um are we i guess we're going to leave it up to the u.s army corps of engineers to determine whether it's non-jurisdictional so that, what we do is we require a delineation if there are any potential wetlands shown on that site right and then that delineator determines whether they're jurisdictional or non-jurisdictional. If we, if we have concerns about that, we may ask them to get a core determination, but you know, if, it's, if, it doesn't, if, if there are no red flags, we'll accept that delineator's identification. Or is that the provision we had recently where two delineators can, can uh, try to get the right? That's correct, that's yeah. correct. There's also that option.
Do you have more? Oh, I thought you were looking for one. I, I am looking, Okay. somebody else can ask questions. If Any they other <laughs> questions for staff? While Brandon is looking, are we going to have a public hearing on both of these, and are we going to do them separately? So I, I'm, the way this was initially published was as two separate items, but the way it'll go to the county commission will be as one text amendment because that's what they're doing. They're amending the zoning ordinance. So there will just be one public hearing um, that would adopt this recommendation. And if you all wanted to change anything in this recommendation, you're certainly welcome to do that. But the intent with that would be in one, one giant recommendation. Okay. <clears throat> I have folks signed up and most are for one of the districts and that's the reason I didn't know if we need to separate. Okay. So I just want to make sure. So Matthew, when we, when the commission votes, um, they're voting on eight and 37 as one text amendment and not separately. That's, that's correct. If the, if you all felt more comfortable, we can certainly do it as two. Personally, it, I would uh, does it mess you up? So the reason why this is interesting and it's kind of a legal nuance is we have this community preservation district which is in the body of the ordinance um, and not necessarily in a local provision. So it kind of creates this weird thing where it gets approved by one and does that mean it doesn't get approved in the second one because it's the same, they're both proposing that same language that's in the body of the, it's just kind of a, so we thought well they're amending the zoning ordinance and we're going through that process, there's no reason they can't just handle all this in one uh, text amendment. But th there's an argument that it could be cleaner to break it into two if there's enough public opposition or concern. So I I'm okay breaking into two if you all feel more comfortable with that. <coughs> I tell you what, let's do it as two in light of the fact that we do have people here with some comments. Okay. So we'll do them one at a time. We can maybe start with District 8 and then go to District 37. Because I do think that, do you want to go ahead and? Well, I guess if we do take it as one item, I'll need to recuse myself from the remainder of the discussion. If we take them as separate, I could stay on for one versus the other. Because Brandon, in my understanding, you're going to recuse, it, if we take them all as one, you'll recuse, but if we yes. separate them out, you're going to be recusing as to the vote on the District 8 recommendation. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Let's do that. Let's Sounds split good. them. And we're going to take eight first. Okay. You're going to recuse In that yourself. case, Mr. Chairman, I recuse myself for the remainder of this discussion. Okay. All right, so we're going to open a public hearing on then on District 8 only. And actually, I don't think I have anyone signed up. Let me just make sure. Andrew Alexander, it, you didn't check a box, so do I assume you were checking? You're here for 37? 37. Okay. So in that case, I have no one signed up for 8. So does anyone, in case you didn't sign up, does anyone want to speak to District 8? You just made it real easy. <laughs> so I guess we'll close the hearing on eight. And uh, uh, you guys have any questions on specifically then on district eight? Okay, and then I'm gonna entertain a motion and you have the conditions outlined on the screen for uh, district eight recommendation. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we recommend approval for the District 8 with conditions set aside by staff. Okay. Mr. Mullins, make a motion to make a rec positive recommendation. Bill, you're seconding that yes. motion? Yes. All right, any questions on the motion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. All right, let Brandon come back and we'll then open the public hearing for District 37. And then I'll go ahead and call on these that have signed up. I have a couple signed up in opposition. I'll start with uh, Joseph Thelford. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm Joe Thetford. I work at the Chase and Chase and Law Firm. Um, Go ahead and stand in front of the microphone just so that they can catch you on uh, I'm Facebook. I'm here Live. representing Robert Randall. Um, Robert owns PPIN, 
number 77702. It's on the north northeast corner of State Highway 104 and St. Michael Way. Okay. So it's one lot over from that large RV1 parcel on the map. Um, we are requesting that you deviate from this map for this parcel and recommend zoning for high density residential with that PPIN 77702. Um, and there's a reason that I've recommended that or asked you to recommend that. And there's a reason I think this parcel should be treated differently. Um, to help here, I'm going to give you a brief history of this parcel. Robert Randall, my client, uh, bought the property in January of 2017. Now, in early 2021, or by early 2021, they began the process of developing an apartment complex. Now, a little bit later in 2021, May, um, they had engaged an engineer, um, Robert Cummings at Favor Engineering, and Robert approached um, the planning department about developing this property for an apartment complex. It's a 258 unit development. Um, from May until this zoning was implemented, uh, Robert and my client worked hand in hand with the planning department towards this development. Um, part of what they did is they uh, subdivided it. I think there was a preliminary subdivision plat approval um, where they were going to divide the northern half, northern 20 acres, it's a 30 acre total parcel, um, divide the northern 20 acres from the southern 20 acres. And that northern 20 acres had all the proper setbacks for this apartment development. Um, and so, they did that um, at one point, I'll give you the date, July 12th of 2021, they applied for a land use uh, certificate and they were told you don't need one because this property is unzoned. They move on um, and again, it's been hand in hand, I'm not repeating everything, but uh, on February 8th, they actually applied for a um, plan unit development site plan approval for this apartment complex. There's a, you can see that stack on the FedEx box over there um, of all the site plans that were created. Again, it's been a tremendous amount of work um, and they've spent, I'm saying they, um, Andy Alexander is um, one of the investors in this project. He's seated over there in the sport coat, and Robert Cummings is next to him, and they may be able to answer questions if y'all have them and I can't answer them about the details of what happened. Um, but at the end of that period, uh, February 8th, they submitted a, a site plan application, and then zoning was voted on on February 15th. And so um, by the end of that period, they had spent over $550,000 towards this development. And that number doesn't include the property. And so we say that all of that time, effort, and money, the changing the design of the property in terms of uh, applying for the subdivision, um, out of fairness and equity, Robert Randall ought to be able to develop his apartment complex. And that has a legal basis as well. Um, that is, Robert has vested rights in the development that they've moved forward with because of all of that time, effort, and energy, and also in reliance on the actions of the planning department. They've worked hand in hand with the planning department. They've done everything they've been asked for that entire time period. And so um, you've got the vested rights issue that I just talked about. And also we say the moratorium doesn't apply because they submitted a land use application. Um, but the planning department disagrees on that issue. And so um, 
that is our first issue. Um, why we would ask you to allow high density residential zoning, which is the zoning that would be required for this development. The second is even if you disagree with all of that, this parcel is less than a mile, right about approximately a mile, from the intersection of State Highway 104 and 181. You'll know that there's a gas station there, there's a Publix going in there, there's um, a hospital going in, and there's a very large church there. It's also right down the road from St. Michael's. And so this is an appropriate area. It is in furtherance of the health, safety, morals, and general welfare to allow multifamily housing with this parcel. Um, and also, we all know there's a tremendous need for multifamily housing in Baldwin County. Um, so even if there was some issue with the vested rights, high-density residential is appropriate for this particular parcel. And another issue that I wanted to point out, um, and this is more for a matter of making the record clear, but um, public uh, notice is required to be published of the zoning election four runs in 30 days prior to the election. And here, the notice was run once in the Islander and then three times in the Onlooker in that 30-day period. And I don't believe you can publish in two separate papers to acquire the four times. And I'll point that out because Robert Randall was unaware of the zoning election here. Um, but basically, this property should be treated differently because of all of the time, effort, money, the reliance on the development uh, planning department. And so what we would ask you to do, if you're inclined to recommend this zoning map, these text amendments, that you make one addition that PPIN number 77702 be um, zoned multi high density residential. Um, and if I can answer any questions, I'm happy to. And I've also, like I said, got um, Andy Alexander and Robert Cummings here that may be able to answer questions as well. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Mr. Chairman. Uh, did you and your clients participate in the advisory committee activities that have led to this? I did not, but Robert Cummings did participate. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Andrew Alexander, do you want to speak? Andy Alexander. I've been in the apartment business for 44 years, uh, owning, managing. We're in Mississippi, Alabama, Mobile and Huntsville, specifically Alabama. Of course, hopefully here in Fairhope. Uh, we're in Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, <coughs> been in South Carolina. It's, we really feel like we built a very fine product. The, in, the, so, the uh, architectural firm we use, we use, we've used for years. Uh, as Joe said, we've got over 560,000 actually invested in this with um, over 500 to three groups, over 200 to our architectural firm, 140 to our engineering firm, and 160 with our lenders. So we've made a serious investment in this project based on what was appropriate and legal, ethical at that time. We certainly wouldn't have made that investment had we thought there was anything wrong with what we were doing. 
Uh, we followed the law, we followed the rules, we played by the game, and we just feel like the game has been changed on us. And after this, this significant investment, we just think, as Joe spoke of the inequity of this situation, uh, you know, we have just finished a project in Kingsland, Georgia, such a nice project that the county fathers asked us to build another one. We're starting another one there. Uh, we're very proud of the product we built. It is an A quality asset with fitness centers, dog parks, playgrounds for the children, uh, resort swimming pools. The rental rates on our property will run anywhere from 1350 on a one bedroom up to probably 25, 2600 on a three bedroom. So this is a quality project. It's a quality property, we believe. Uh, we've known of the property actually for a couple of years now and have been working on it for well over a year. So I'm only saying that we put a lot into this. We spent a lot on it. Money that's not re retrievable has, if this project doesn't go forward. So we really like your consideration in eliminating this property. And again, as I said, we, we thought everything was done. Of course, we hired Faber Engineering, a local engineering firm, to handle this for us. We thought it was all done. Uh, we were really quite surprised when the check got returned to us, which just happened the first week of April or middle, middle of April, I believe. So if you have any questions, I'm more than glad to answer and take your questions. Okay, any questions, Mr. Alexander? Mr. Chairman, can I ask one question? I think it came up in our advisory committee that one reason for the delay in the submittal, because it's true, y'all have been working on this for a long time and lots of people work on projects for a long time and they just never happen, okay? But y'all were applying for HUD funding and that a lot of the delay was getting everything in line to have everything line up for that HUD funding before you could even make a submittal to our department. And I'd like to also explain when it comes to HUD funding, what he's talking about HUD funding, it's really just a financing tool. It's no different than Fannie, Freddie, or any other bank. Uh, there is no qualification in HUD financing. The, the, the purpose of HUD, HUD has a mission to provide housing where every other bank isn't looking to make deals. Uh, they're looking for more rural areas. Uh, there's no qualification on the income level of the resident. There's no qualification on the rent level of the property. HUD, HUD financing has a mission to provide housing in, again, more rural areas, areas where everybody isn't beaten down the door to build a property. So I don't want any, I don't want any aspersions cast on HUD financing thinking that it's a affordable housing project, because it's not. I mean, as I said, you know, we have HUD financing on our Kingsland property, and it's just another source of financing. I mean, obviously, I'm not sure if Many of you are familiar with Kingsland, Georgia. It's where the submarine base is and uh, the spaceport is going in there as well. But there's just not a lot of banks knocking down the door to loan money in Kingsland, Georgia. HUD does provide that kind of financing. But again, there's no criteria for HUD financing on the income level of the resident or the rental level of the property. And I was mainly highlighting the delay. It wasn't on staff's part or anything. It was it was y'all were working on other things related to the project and just didn't submit it. Well, I think we did submit it. I mean, we we submitted it uh, in time. And what happened was the uh, the request came back to us late, actually on February eighth, uh, to provide a traffic study which wasn't, wasn't requested earlier, otherwise we would, request, we, would, we would have acquired it and developed, delivered it earlier. Also, the other issue there is that evidently it came back to us, the traffic study is needed for 250 units or larger, we're 258. Had we been told traffic study was required, we certainly could have dropped down to 248 units, 230 units, whatever the number, to eliminate that requirement. So there were options that we had and again, working hand in hand with the uh, zoning board or the county down here, we would have been more than glad to make any necessary change to make the project move forward. I, I sort of feel like it was sort of 
held in limbo and then thrown back at us uh, in a time fashion that we didn't we weren't able to respond to it. Okay. Any questions, Mr. Alexander? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. That's all I had signed up in opposition. I'm going to go through these that are signed up in favor. Uh, the first one I have, um, I'm trying my best. Timothy, you'll have to help me with your last name. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Uh, I, I mainly signed up to show my support for 37, but an observation that I've made this evening that I, I feel that I need to speak upon is that I watched you, I watched you folks within the law tell a man who wanted to put a swimming pool in his backyard in a house that he purchased that you were sorry but within the laws and regulations, you couldn't make that exception. How can you in good faith make an exception for someone in the same meeting and then look at that man in his face and tell him that you couldn't for him? And that's all I'd like to say. Okay. Rebecca Teal. Good evening. Um, I was one of the members that was on the advisory committee for District 37, and um, I listened to the gentleman that just spoke, and uh, I'm making notes. We asked them during our meeting when they approached us about this if they were willing to make changes to the planned development there because um, I believe his development was four stories and we were told during the meeting that they were not willing to make those changes. So I just want that to be, be noted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Gina, told you. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gina Todia. I live in planning district 37 on Lawrence road extension. And I was also a committee member. And I appreciated very much all the hard work of the staff and my fellow committee members. Um, I'm going to let maybe Elizabeth talk about uh, the proposal that's been made regarding the zoning on this one parcel. I just wanted to say that I think it's great that we were able to get some special wetland protections into our um, local provisions. And if you'll note if you look at the map that our entire east side, except for the very north East Park is along Fish River. And a lot of that is, um, you know, estate size lots, larger parcels, and even some conservation land. So these added buffers, uh, the 100 foot buffer, that actually came out of the Fairhope subdivision regulations. <coughs> Excuse me. So I thought that we should at least match what, what Fairhope was doing. Uh, as far as protecting Fish River. And then the jurisdictional versus non-jurisdictional wetlands is something that I feel strongly about. I think that we should be protecting all of our wetlands and not just the ones that the Corps of Engineers thinks uh, fall under their regulatory jurisdiction. Uh, jurisdictional wetlands over the last few years have been kind of a moving target. That situation continues. Um, the Corps is currently discussing whether some of the swale wetlands down on the coast should be considered jurisdictional. And they've, for many years, been considered jurisdictional and regulated. And so this is kind of a moving target. So anything we can put in place to protect our wetlands, I think, is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Wilson. Y'all can blame me for this extended meeting. <laughs> I started this whole process. Um, just a few rebuttals um, for this, those guys. Um, on December 15th, Fairhope issued a moratorium. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do want to 
just highlight here that this really isn't, the purpose is really not rebuttals and back and forth in, in this particular instance. And okay, I'm not, I'll stop. Um, and I'm not trying to be hard I on you. I just want to make sure, yeah. Do, you know, uh, that, that, that's just not the purpose of this portion of it. Okay. Well, I hope you all accept our District 37 provisions. We worked really hard. We considered a lot of stuff. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. Mary Hawkins. But anyway, I did attend seven of the eight meetings that they had. No, I was not in the committee. Um, I did collect a couple of hundred signatures, though. <laughs> but um, my thing is I would like the staff to consider leaving this little road right here. Branchwood Drive, Branchwood Development. It's a small 32-lot development. It is currently RSF1. And the reason I'm asking this, and I may not, I mean, this zoning ordinance stuff, you need a law degree and an engineering degree to get through that book. But anyway, the issue that, the concern is there is one undeveloped lot connected with that subdivision. It faces, and it is the only one, that faces County Road 33. And my concern is with the Community Preservation District that that may allow zoning to change, or it wouldn't be RSF1, it could be RRRACR or even a B1, B2. Am I correct? Under so that, that's a great question. The way that it would work is if someone came and they wanted to do something other than a single family dwelling there, they would have to request a rezoning and then it would go through the same process as if it was RSF1 and they wanted to do something else there. So I don't, in my opinion, um, whether it's community preservation or RSF1, both would require them to go through a rezoning both process. Both is going to is going to automatically gonna do, require re rezoning? If they're going to do something other than a single-family dwelling there and it's an undeveloped lot. Okay. See? Like I said, need a law degree to figure it out. <laughs> the second thing was, um, <clears throat> and y'all don't laugh at me, the animal husbandry under, allowed in all single-family residential districts. Now, granted, I was there when the committee voted, and it's five people, and... Three voted to allow it, two didn't, although I think one of the three was kind of iffy on it. I don't have, I mean, I agree with the roosters, okay? Nobody wants a rooster. And I don't have a problem with somebody in a residential subdivision, whatever, having a chicken coop, you know, for hens, you know, to do their own personal eggs. However, I do feel like that if you're going to have hogs, horses, goats, whatever, that you need to have over an acre piece of property to have them. Saying that, you sit there and think, well, no one with less than an acre would have that. Well, let me tell you what. We live in a crazy damn world right now, and there ain't no telling what Joe Blow's going to do. Okay? So, I would ask that. We amend that little wordage there for over an acre on allowing animal husbandry. And otherwise, I appreciate y'all's time. It's getting late. <coughs> I don't know about y'all, but I need a margarita. So <laughs> we'll get with it. Okay, that's all I had signed up. Is there anyone I missed? Okay. So, Matthew, can you clarify clearly for us the county's position on <clears throat> the one case we've talked about? Is it just it was submitted later, did not have all of the information that was required for submittal, and as such, it wasn't considered an actual submittal? I'm glad you asked that question, Mr. Chairman. I teed it um, up for you, okay. And uh, I'm going to uh, ask Mr. Buford King to just highlight what took place there in terms of those timelines. So, Chairman, Commissioners, um, what I'm about to give you, and I'll try to be as quickly as possible, but thorough as well, 
this is not exhaustive, but these are some very important milestone dates. Um, so yes, on April 8th, 2022, staff did receive a planned unit development for the apartment complex as discussed prior. That was reviewed same day. We have an intake review process. I can explain that if there are any questions about that. Every application we receive receives an intake review, uh, receives an intake review due to the fact that many applications we receive, if not most applications we receive, are deficient in some way. That intake review revealed two major deficiencies with the application. One, as we heard earlier, that the traffic study was not included, which is one of the most basic requirements of our development regulations, that if you have 50 or more units, a traffic study is required. That's mandatory. Secondly, it, a drainage narrative was submitted, but the drainage narrative submitted was not for the apartment complex. It was a very basic drainage narrative, much like you saw earlier today for the two lot subdivision that preceded the PUD. So we, the same day, our staff member, Fabio Waters, notified the applicant early afternoon, same day, this application is incomplete due to these two major deficiencies. That was on Tuesday the 8th. Obviously, the referendum was on the 15th. Um, that same week on Friday the 11th, we received a bit of a confusing situation, which there's no need to go into here. But in brief, the applicant attempted to submit the construction plans for construction plans review. And we have gone through that ad nauseum already tonight about the difference between that and the preliminary process, whether that preliminary process be a subdivision or a PUD. But in the correspondence that followed that process, again, it was reiterated, the PUD is incomplete. We didn't have any other correspondence until March 25th. And so the applicant's engineer requested staff, would we consider proceeding with conduct, carrying out that construction plans review to get a head start? And though we appreciate the request and understand the desire to attempt to get a head start on construction plans review, ultimately they did not submit that because we advised against that we'll get into the weeds very briefly here, is that they would have to pay $75 per unit non-refundable for that review. So they declined carrying out the construction plans review on 258 units. But again, in that correspondence, we reiterated the PUD is incomplete. Buford, can I interrupt just one second? Ask yes, sir. Question. <clears throat> We're talking about April 8th, 22. That's just about 60 days ago. They first come up with this submittal, correct? So on February 8th of 2022 was when All we right. did and received the initial submittal. The incompleteness or whatever right then, that was same day, April 8th again. Yes, sir. Same, right. uh, same February, 8th. February, February 8th. February 8th. Uh, February 8th. Same day was the notification of it being an incomplete February application. February the 8th. Yes, sir. Okay, February the 8th. Um, they were no, the construction plans for review were incomplete on April 11th. Do I have that date right? So, yes, sir. And, and, uh, and so then, on, on when, February 11th, there was an attempt to submit construction plans. Uh, we basically declined accepting them. But in that correspondence reiterated, the PUD is incomplete. Now you're trying to submit construction plans. So we need a complete PUD. Now, again, this was on the 11th. So the initial notification was on the 8th. So there was a good six days for that application to be made complete before the referendum. And the referendum was on what day? The 15th of February of this year. February 15th was the referendum. Yes, sir. So there was not really anything completed prior to the referendum. That's correct. Okay. That, that that's correct. correct. And commissioners, that's why you haven't seen this case. A technical review has not been conducted on that case because as we sit here today, it is still incomplete. Uh, but to finish the timeline very briefly, as we mentioned on the 25th of March, we had some follow-up correspondence. We reiterated the PUD is incomplete. On April 18th, we did finally receive the traffic study. Uh, that was submitted, uploaded into CitizenServe that we use. And we basically advised the applicant's engineer that, thank you, we will hold this in abeyance until the moratorium terminates. The next day, the 19th, we received a revised drainage narrative 
Um, but it was the same drainage narrative that was initially submitted on the 8th of February, but was retitled to match the title of the apartment complex project. Uh, so what that means, commissioners, is where we sit today, we have a PUD held in abeyance that is incomplete, but it was declared incomplete before the moratorium went into effect. And just to clarify, it remains complete to, incomplete today. They have not yet submitted uh, a, a valid drainage st study or narrative for the project. Okay. All right. Any questions for staff? Any discussion on this item or or the animal husbandry item, which is interesting. Just to item, maybe allay some concerns there, there is a note in that provision that uh, that just reminds folks that they still need to check with their homeowners association, make sure they're not violating their homeowners association. The thought was that if you're in an HOA, most likely that's going to be disallowed, and so there is an avenue for that property owner to pursue some type of action, albeit it'll be a civil type action. Um, and so this was kind of a simple way to address that at the advisory committee's request. So if, if there, w let me give an example. So if there's an existing development, a new development comes in next door, the existing development has a covenant against animal husbandry. The next door comes in one that has no restriction. The advisory committee's fine with that scenario with that mix. I would hate to live in the existing subdivision and that be allowed next door to me. That's just me, but I, I don't live in that district, so I'm, I'm just curious if that was vetted out, that they understand that you're going to get that. But they do, and that's why we did put the requirement that we not allow roosters. I, the, the overall arching theme here is that as a general rule, this district is a rural district. Even the, the infill areas you can see are still primarily rural agricultural areas. And so they didn't want zoning to abandon the rural nature and qualities of these residential lots. And I understand that, but there are some very nice subdivisions within this district that I would just find it odd to have this next door. But again, that's neither here nor there for me. So. Uh, the one acre makes sense. I mean, is there any objections to that? Uh, the staff wouldn't staff wouldn't be opposed to that. You know, if, if that's uh, I, uh, you know, that's why this public hearing exists to debate and discuss these things and hear both sides. It, in in both advisory committees, there were concerns and questions and debates, which is how the rooster thing got put in there. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, um, that's that's why this public hearing exists. Absolutely. Well, I understand her comment. I live in the town of Silver Hill, and I remember a day walking through town, and there was an 800-pound pig in someone's home in the middle of town, and it stayed there for six months. And I personally wouldn't want that next door to me, but that's me. So she's right. You, you can get just about, when you open that door, be ready. Somebody will st take advantage of it. But that's me. All right. What do you want to do? Yep. Uh, I'm going to defer to the chairman on that. But it, so the question is, um, I think some folks, if they're, if that, I think some folks weren't expecting that change to be brought to the floor and would like to give comment on, you know, maybe why they think it'd be better not to limit it to an acre. Um, but I have to let you entertain uh, that. Well, let me ask. Sure.
And I mean, she, th there may be a difference between hens and goats, cows, pigs, and things like that within what they were discussing during their eight meetings. Yeah, because I think horses and ponies and, and up the road from me I'm on probably a quarter acre lot, there's two ponies and some other animals shoved in a fence and it, they, they don't belong. But I think she's right. I mean, if we're trying to separate hens and chickens and we need to separate it from horses and, and those type of animals instead of including them all in, in one. And, and I guess according to this definition, animal husbandry means that you've got to be raising it for the meat, fiber, eggs, milk, or other food products. Am I reading that correctly? That's, so that would correct. not cover a horse that you would, well, to me, that doesn't cover most horses where you're just raising them for riding or, or pleasure versus uh, end products. Is that right? Well, it certainly includes chickens, pigs, goats. Right. And I just want to remind the audience that this is a live feed, and so if you're going to speak, the chairman has to give deference. So that way everybody can hear the comments on the, the live feed. I, I certainly don't mind if someone from the advisory committee wants to speak to this. So... This was intended because RSF1, which is 30,000 square foot lots, you can't have chickens, right? So there is no chicken police. So it was intended, that was the design. If you're in an RSF1, you should be able to have chickens. Um, I am into like urban farming, having like a garden in your backyard. This is not designed to have a cow in your backyard. I don't think that that is what it would be. Um, we were trying to be unrestrictive um, in keeping that rural feel. Um, I feel very, very passionately and strongly about this, um, especially in this day and age of being able to grow and produce your own food. Um, I think originally, like the, my rough draft said something along in the state, in the act of self-sufficiency, you should be able to have chickens and the garden and stuff like that. Um, so that was my intention with this was basically if you are on an R1 lot, which is still a large lot, you should be able to have chickens and support yourself in a time of crisis. Um, but not just limited to chickens. I mean, there's like little baby goats and stuff like that. If you're in a, it was just to, to be unrestrictive, but to still allow you to be self-sufficient. Um, most of the neighborhoods would have an HOA. Um, people, and to, the counter argument is people have dogs. How many times have you woken up at 2.30 in the morning to your neighbor's dog barking and raising heck? Nobody puts a law on dogs, so why would you put a law on a chicken? No, I'm, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with everything you just said. Chickens don't bother me near as much as what I'm saying is that does not restrict it to just chickens. It allows just about everything as it pertains to raising it for meat, uh, eggs, milk. So it, it opens the door for other I mean, yeah, things. You could, have, like, you could have a goat and milk your goat. They're little. Lunch. But, but it would leave it open to a cow. I yeah, mean, I that's 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 our issue. Is it leaves yeah, it too open-ended? I mean, a dog and Should a cow is two different things, and it, it would leave it open-ended. I mean, it would allow yeah. a cow. I mean, could we put much. a weight limit on the animal, like less than 150 pounds? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and uh, Miss Elizabeth is <laughs> Miss Elizabeth is very passionate about this, and we appreciate that. <laughs> um, you know, w one thing y'all could recommend is that staff revisit this to add some um, parcel size appropriate designations based on the livestock type and bring that modification to the county commission. I mean, I think that certainly gets closer to what I think the issue is. Because what happens is you have these lots that were divided off years ago and they're still part of maybe a, 
family subdivision homestead where they might have a, a horse that shares part of the lot or a couple goats. But now, because of the family subdivision that took place years ago, technically they're no longer allowed to, allowed to have that if we go with an RSF1 designation that's closer to that a lot size. I'm going to make a motion. How do I need a word there? <laughs> so let, let, me, um, let me just switch back to this page. And, you know, keeping in mind the varying requests we've re had related to District 37, if your plan, if your only additional modification is for staff to propose some modified language for the animal husbandry thing, then you would just say recommend, uh, adopt staff's recommendation as shown for District 37 with this modification and you just say parcel specific designations for the animal husbandry to address the size of the parcel for animals. And we'll, we'll take it from there. Mr. Michael Chairman, I'll, I'll make that motion. At least it'll give us an opportunity to discuss and move forward. Okay. So your motion is the conditions that are listed plus uh, the condition with the animal husband. That is correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. The motion is uh, a recommendation to the county commission to approve this district with those conditions. All right. I have a second. Second. Bill has made the motion. Mr. Davis has seconded the motion. Now, any questions on the motion? I think it's the right course. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. And just as a reminder for everybody that this was a recommendation that you all made and the, this will now go to the county commission for final adoption of the zoning ordinance amendment. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, could I, or, can I just say one thing before we, we go away from the uh, uh, new zoning areas, new zoned areas? Um, I was involved in District 19, which really sort of got this movement moving forward of zoned areas that, that needed to be zoned within the county, that zoning was not a bad thing. Uh, I want to say that uh, Matthew and his team were great to work with, led us through some very bumpy times. And it's clear to me that with District 8 and District uh, 37, that they did the same thing there. And I think that that's a credit to the county and the credit to you and your staff. And I just wanted to say that publicly because uh, it, it, it's a process that's working. Thank you, Bill. All right, we have one more item under old business case number S20013 Camellia Place subdivision is an extension request. The request before you tonight is a one year extension request for a preliminary plan approval for Camellia Place subdivision. I'm sorry, this was not supposed to. This is the originally approved plat. They have already completed phase one. They've already recorded the final plat. This is your aerial vicinity map, site map. Preliminary plat approval was granted on July 9, 2020, with a two-year approval expiring July 9, 2022. Phase one final plat administrative approval was granted on January 13, 2022, and recorded in slide number 2822-C. Phase two final plat was submitted May 3rd, 2022, and had some outstanding items to be addressed before final plat approval could be granted. Out of an abundance of caution, the applicant submitted an extension request dated May 16, 2022, as shown to the right. Since the extension request has been submitted for consideration for approval, the applicant has received a no deficiency letter from the highway department, also shown to the right. Applicants should be able to receive final plat approval prior to preliminary plat expiration. However, approval of the extension is subject to current subdivision regulations, 
in place at time of approval. Staff does recommend approval for this extension request. I have okay. answer any questions you may have. Okay. I have one person that signed up. This is not a public hearing, is it? No, sir. Are you going to wait and just, just do it then at public comments? Yes. All right. All right. Any questions for staff? All right. Entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we uh, extend, approve, recommend approval to ex for this extension for Camellia Place. Okay. Second. The motion is to approve the extension, seconded by Mr. Dye, or Mr. Bice. Okay. Any questions, comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So under public comments, I have one person signed up, uh, Reva Frelick. Frolic, I'm not sure how if I pronounce that right. My name is Reva Freilich. I live at 20810 West Boulevard. I live um, just south of Camellia on the east side of West Boulevard, so about a quarter mile from the subdivision. Um, my family moved to Fairhope in 1976. My mom still lives there. My dad was a, uh, the chief building official for the city of Coral Gables, so I really appreciate all the work you all do. So thank you very much. I've attended a handful of meetings with the Baldwin County en Environmental Advisory Committee and I just had some, I was looking up something else about the Novellus site when I came across, oh, they got this going on. Um, I had a few issues, but I'll, be, I'll try to keep it within three minutes. Uh, one, D.R. Horton, I noticed that he's there, the developer of this project, and I guess you all know about the mass action lawsuit for uh, deceptive trade practices regarding their gold fortified um, gold cert, uh, fortified designation that they had significant building code, code violations. They advertise on their website that uh, this prime location offers a rural retreat where you can take refuge. Um, I don't know how much land, how many dump trucks they've dumped there to build phase one, um, but it's a lot of hundreds of dump trucks. So I don't know, as far as raising uh, the elevation and the drainage, I know it goes out to the west of the property, I believe. Um, I'm, and it's in planning district 14. I don't know if I'm in the same planning district if I'm across the street, West Boulevard. So that field, that project is surrounded by fields on the east of it and south of it. Um, I think there are sort of, I, I agree we need affordable housing, those houses start at $270,000 each, and it's $1,406 uh, $1, a month. I don't know if that's affordable housing or not. I was worried, besides them, you know, I, growth is coming, and as uh, in, it, in full honesty, as a member of the Environmental Advisory, not a member of the Environmental Advisory Committee, but I'm with the Fairhope Unitarian Fellowship Social and Environmental Action Committee. I'm also the group leader for Citizens Climate Lobby for Baldwin County. I'm also a member of the Sierra Club, and Vaughn, Va Vaughn Milner and I are both on the State of Alabama Sierra Club Executive Committee. So I would consider myself an environmentalist. <laughs> um, I think when we talk about in infrastructure needs, the schools, I, um, and I understand, I've learned a lot tonight, I really have, it's been very interesting and educational. Um, so I guess you guys advise the city, or the city of Silver Hill about the schools. The fire department, same thing, Silver Hill has a vol volunteer fire department. Um, and then I don't know if they're on city water, county water, or sewer, but I wound up going to the Fort Morgan uh, wastewater treatment plant hearing with ADEM, and you all are going to have, of course, with growth, issues with growth, and what are we going to do with the sewage department down there, um, which is publicly owned, I mean, privately owned, but maybe it should be publicly owned by you all, 
and you guys lease it back to them or something, but that's going to be a major issue. Besides um, roads, traffic, and the drainage, there's also light pollution. Um, just on 49 on the west side, just if you go up 49 to the intersection of 104 and 49, they're building a new boxing gym there, and the lights are bright like city lights, so we're, that's light pollution. And then I had some um, environmental issues. Um, I don't know, are you aware of the power lines that go along, the high tension power lines that go along the east side of that proposed plant? Well, before I moved into my house in 2013, um, I did research on EMF, electromag electromagnetic frequency radiation from the power lines, and it has been indicated in um, uh, leukemia in children if you live close to them. So I don't think they should be allowed to build that eastern portion of those houses. Um, the other thing is, uh, unless they at least tell the people about the power line danger. The other danger is from all, is all, is from all the pe chemicals and pesticides and herbicides that they use on the field just east of there and south of there. We've grown everything. They grow, you know, sweet potatoes, cotton, um, soybeans. I had, uh, and, the, and they have the agricultural aerial applicators, the crop dusters coming in and spraying all the time. I think they should know about that because this is that urban rural interface zone. Um, and what else? Power lines, okay. And also, in case you all don't know, there is a cancer cluster in Baldwin County. I don't know if you've heard of Leslie Pacey and her work, but um, so something's going on here. I just wanted to make sure from a social and environmental justice aspect that we take into consideration what's com coming regarding the you know climate crisis, maybe climate resilience. There's no um, sidewalks there. There's no playground. But I mean, it, it's going to take all of us working together. And I appreciate it. I'd like to find out how to um, maybe start a planning district for District 14, if you all could give me guidance. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Okay, staff reports. Mr. Chairman, I don't know if this is a staff report, but I just want to commend Matthew for the preparation of the Community Preservation District. I think that that is the finest piece of public policy that I have ever seen. <laughs> okay. I think the record should reflect here that while he was out in work session, I did give him credit for that. So, uh, Okay, legal counsel. I don't have any formal report. Um, we've been working closely with the department. You know, there's a lot of new things that this department is thinking of, a lot of um, interesting ways to handle the growth that is going on in Baldwin County. And I think with what we have going on here, you know, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse when everyone wants to live where you live. Um, but it also, you know, it's not a cookie cutter fit like it may be for other areas of the United States. And so I think what the department and Matthew and everyone that he has on board here, the way that they're thinking outside of the box and the way that they're trying to come up with solutions that fit Baldwin County and the particular areas of Baldwin County, because we are so different, um, is the right way to do it. And it's just really, um, it's, um, you know, Sometimes we get legal questions and we jump on them, but you know I think that the whether we can do them or not sometimes it's the thought process that our planning department has, you know, that is so special and I think is really helping this county grow in the in the right way and think about how to grow in the right way. So I also we give kudos to everyone and all the work that they do on it. Well said, thank you. All right, our next meeting is July 7th. Nothing else? We are adjourned. Thank you all.